This meeting will now come to order. Will the clerk please call the roll? Mayor Carlett. Here. Vice Mayor Finn. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Hunt. Here. Councilmember Patena. Here. Councilmember Binsbacher. Here. Councilmember Edwards. Here. And Councilmember Leone. Here. Good evening and welcome to the Peoria City Council special meeting of September 4th, 2018. Uh, we have two items on our study session agenda tonight, and we are going to begin with the first one, proposed ordinance prohibiting texting while operating a motor vehicle. And uh, with us this evening for our presentation is our city attorney, Vanessa Hickman, and I will turn it over to you to begin. Great. Thank you very much, Mayor, and, and good evening to all of you, Mayor, and members of the council. Uh, I was asked by some of you sitting here this evening um, at both ends of the table, the city manager as well as members of the council, to bring forward a draft ordinance for review and discussion which would prohibit texting while operating a motor vehicle. To begin with, I'm going to ask you a question that can really drive this home. So how do you feel when you get in the car and realize that you've left your phone at home? So is it that moment of panic, thinking how is this going to affect the rest of my day? Do I turn around? Am I going to be late for my meeting? So the fact is, cell phones have become an integral part of our daily existence. With the change in technology, you can see some of the earlier renditions of the cell phone, some of which were affixed to our cars with long cables, and then the, uh, the Blackberry, which some of us held on to for so long and couldn't get rid of. And then finally, the more recent technology. So as technology gets easier, it becomes more and more part of our daily existence. The fact is that 60% of drivers talked hands-free, while almost 50% talked on a handheld cell phone in the past month. Uh, those were statistics from 2017, and those were drivers who voluntarily responded to a survey. The numbers are probably much higher than that. Um, you know, a, a big statistic is almost 97% of drivers view texting or emailing while driving as a serious threat. With texting, one of the reasons why it's such a, uh, a large consequence and such a serious discussion is that when you text, uh, on average, you take your eyes off the road for about five seconds. And that five seconds is long enough to cover a football field while driving 55 miles per hour. There are three main types of driving distractions that one recognizes under the category of distracted driving. And texting combines all three, which makes it particularly dangerous. It's visual, which is taking your eyes off the road. Manual, taking your hands off the wheel. And then cognitive, which is taking your mind off what you're doing. And again, texting combines all three of those distracted driving principles. Texting has also been documented to be six times more dangerous than driving while intoxicated. In 2016, 3,450 people were killed in vehicle crashes involving distracted drivers. Now, texting while driving causes at least 3,000 deaths per year and accounts for 330,000 injuries each year. And again, those are approximate numbers based on the most reliable information that has been compiled. In a survey done by the AAA Foundation for Traffic Safety in 2017, almost 88% of the respondents supported a texting ban and 41% supported an outright ban on using any type of cell phone while driving. By way of background, 47 states have banned texting while driving. Only three states, Arizona, Montana, and Missouri, have not adopted legislation that bans texting while driving. And in fact, Missouri bans texting while driving for those that are 21 and younger. So only Arizona and Montana are the two states that have failed to adopt any statewide legislation that bans texting while driving. Arizona only prohibits new drivers under the age of 18 from using wireless communication devices within the first six months of receiving their license. And there have been 11 previous failed attempts by the Arizona State Legislature to pass a statewide ban. 
Several Arizona cities and counties have adopted distracted driving legislation that outright prohibits the use of mobile communication devices while driving. Uh, those are Flagstaff, Kingman, Oro Valley, Sedona, Surprise, Tucson, Tempe, Coconino County, and Pima County. The city of Phoenix has banned texting while driving, but does not prohibit the use of mobile communication devices to make phone calls while driving. Our ordinance would be similar in that sense to the city of Phoenix, at least the proposed option that we're here to discuss tonight, because that option would again be prohibiting texting while driving, not an all-out ban on the use of cell phones while driving. Uh, so the language on your screen is a mouthful, but I will go ahead and go through it. It's necessary in order to make sure we're addressing every possible scenario and creating a clear enforcement option for police officers that are citing under the ordinance, as well as those that would eventually prosecute should there be a citation issued. So the ordinance as drafted would read, it shall be unlawful for any person to manually enter alphanumeric text, numbers, images, or symbols into, read from, or manipulate touchscreen controls of a mobile communication device while operating a motor vehicle. This includes using various functions, applications, or tasks of a mobile communication device to engage in gaming, interact with social media sites, view the internet, compose, send, read, or view a text message, email, blog post, picture, drawing, or video. So as you can see, there were a lot of discussions and thought that went into making sure we had captured the full picture of what might cause people to look at their phone, engage in that distracted driving behavior that can all fall under that larger description of texting while driving and lead to some of these statistics that we were going over earlier. Uh, we did provide for exemptions uh, in the draft ordinance, and those exemptions would be to initiate, conduct, or terminate phone calls. So again, the purpose would not be to prohibit an individual from initiating a phone call, from talking on the phone, or, or terminating their phone call. It would also provide an exception for virtual or personal assistants, such as Siri, Cortana, or a Google Assistant, whatever other technology might be out there that we haven't listed, uh, to listen to and or vocally compose or send text messages, or input, select, or listen to informa information on a global positioning or navigation system. We understand how important it is for the GPS systems and also how reliant many of us have become on uh, those uh, aspects of our, of our mobile technology. Uh, to report an immediate emergency to public safety personnel or request assistance with a medical emergency, safety hazard, or criminal activity. Again, that's another exception. Another exception for law enforcement or public safety personnel operating authorized emergency vehicles in the course and scope of his or her duties. The ordinance as drafted would be a primary civil traffic violation. So an officer can stop a vehicle if he or she observes a violation of the ordinance. It would involve a maximum civil penalty of $250 plus applicable surcharges or other assessments if not involved in a motor vehicle accident. Uh, there could be increased civil penalties if the violation occurs within 12 months of an earlier violation for texting while driving. And then there would also be an aggravated offense, which would be a class one misdemeanor. And that would be if there was a motor vehicle accident which resulted in bodily harm to another person. So moving forward, uh, some of the items that we'd like to discuss with you are obviously to get your feedback on the ordinances drafted, the scope, uh, your, your desires on what the ordinance would look like and uh, any issues that you've identified. You know, have that discussion tonight, talk to you about outreach and get your feedback on, on what that might look like if this ordinance were to move forward. And then the implementation. So the implementation involving that outreach um, as well as putting it on an agenda down the road if that's the direction the council would like to move after tonight's discussion and uh, you know, working on our path going forward. I did include just a little, uh, a little excerpt from 
you know, public safety types of information that the city does send out that are friendly reminders about texting while driving. And I think at a minimum, you know, these are just some of the examples of things that we need to do as a city to, you know, regardless of the discussion this evening, to make sure that we're reminding people about the dangers of, of texting while driving. So tonight I'm, I'm offering you an option, uh, should you decide that this is the time that the city would like to move forward to address this type of distracted driving. And I'm looking to you, Mayor and Council, for direction on how to move forward. And with that, I would be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you for doing all of the work on this. Absolutely. It looks like there was some extensive research um, trying to figure out all of the possibilities that there are. Yes. Um, I'm sure that was very time consuming. So I appreciate all of your work on this. Absolutely, Mayor. Thank you. Council, do you have any questions? Yes. Council Member Thank Patel. you, Mayor. Ms. Hickman, just a question. The, uh, the maximum penalty you said in terms of monetary would be $250. Is that fine um, determined by the court at that point? So, Mayor, Council Member Patena, yes, that fine would be determined by the court, and that, that fine would be consistent with other civil violations that we have in code, and is consistent with other cities and, and what they're assessing. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you. Council Member Binsbacher. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, well, I'm really happy to see us moving this direction. I have a question about, is this one step towards another? Should we decide we wanted to ban the use of electronics completely? Are they done in separate st stages? Sure. Mayor, Council Member Binsbacher, the ordinance is drafted would be just to ban texting while driving. It would be a midway point, if you will, should the city decide to go all the way to requiring hands-free. So it would have to occur in stages. Uh, the banning texting while driving would be a current ordinance, and then should the city decide to move forward with all out prohibiting use of cell phones while driving, that would have to be a separate discussion and action by the council. Yes, just a follow up comment. So um, I, I definitely support moving this direction, but would like to keep that conversation going, would be <laughs> my opinion. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council, Thank you. council Member Bisbach. Councilmember Edwards. Thank you, Mayor. Um, for Vanessa, I have a couple of questions. So how does this differ the, from the uh, current uh, distracted driving law that's on the books through the state? Sure, thank you, uh, Mayor, Councilmember Edwards. So the, quote, distracted drivers law that is on the books with the state is actually the application of reckless driving. And so reckless driving has a standard that's subjective and what's reasonable and prudent under the circumstances, that can be difficult to prove. So it becomes, a, again, a subjective argument and discussion uh, with what an officer believed was not reasonable and prudent under the circumstances, and then having to prove that in an evidentiary fashion to support the citation can be very challenging. So having an ordinance that directly applies to prohibiting texting while driving gives you that enforcement mechanism that again applies directly to that behavior, prohibits that behavior, and allows a, a clear penalty to apply. Thank you, and then a follow-up question. So you mentioned um, with the youth at the, you know, for the first six months of their, of their driving, what would, what would happen if a, a young individual was cited, had a ticket, um, and then they do it again, and then they do it again. Is there something that we could report back to the DMV to basically say that this individual has gone multiple times, is not listening, and so rather than getting their full driving privileges, that, that, that they would waive that until they turn 18? I mean, I don't want to do that, but I mean, young individuals sometimes, you know, don't, don't heed the warning and don't heed the ticket, so... Yes, uh, Mayor, Council Member Edwards, so that was not something that we researched as part of this draft ordinance. Again, the current prohibition in law pro you know, prohibits the, the youth from within the first six months of obtaining their license. We could certainly add language to an ordinance that moved forward that had uh, a, a more aggressive treatment towards you know, those that are under 21 or those that are under 18 based on certain number of infractions. You know, keep in mind, this one does have a, an enhanced penalty for anyone 
that is cited more a second time within 12 months. So that is to address the repeat offenders, and we could step that up from there if that's the desire of the mayor and council mayor and council members moving forward. I just don't want it to get to the last the last step where it becomes an aggravated texting, you know, and yes. and potential you know criminal time behind bars. I don't want Certainly. that to happen. And so, you know, if, if we could stop that bad behavior or potential bad behavior ahead of time, I, I would like to see that. We Mayor might be able to, member. we might be able to accomplish that with the education Absolutely. period Absolutely. in advance of, and then, you know, see how see things how are going. And I'm fully okay with that. So great. Thank you. Mayor. Council member Hunt. <coughs> well, I've already talked to a couple of you this week. I, in my core, I am fundamentally against government overreach into people's private lives. I think this skates so close to it that it bothers me. Um, but I like, I like that it's only texting because we talked about a couple of other things that you took out the GPS business and all. I also understand that with some things that are personal decisions to make, they don't really affect other people. I mean, they like seatbelts, for example. You're taking your own life in your hands when you refuse before the law and all. Um, and I see so many other things that I think are just as eating while you're driving. Are, really, are we going to legislate against that? Are we going to legislate against talk radio? Because that's really, it occupies my brain when I'm driving. Uh, reaching over and searching for a station that you want to hear on the radio. Uh, kids screaming and yelling in the back seat. Distracted moms. Uh, there are so many things that I think rise to this level. And we certainly can't legislate against all of them. Thank goodness we cannot. Um, I'm not going to oppose this because I've done a lot of thinking about it this week. I do like the way it's written better than the way I first got it. And however, I would object to going further with it. I will not support going to abandoning hands, whatever that was that Bridget said. Um, I think hands-free is fine. My radio talk show is hands-free. Um, haven't had a wreck yet. Uh, I think when you punch this button and say, text so-and-so. I'm not sure I understand. <laughs> she always answers me. Um, I, I, don't, I don't see that as a distraction. And when I'm talking to someone that way with it laying over here, I, it's, it possibly is a distraction, depending on what we're talking about, but it's not any more of a distraction than me hearing news on the radio that I don't like or, or disagreeing, or even having someone as a passenger that's, that we're having a heated discussion, not that that ever happens, but um, there are just so many other things that I would really object to moving further in this. I think the actual sitting and sending love notes to your boyfriend or whatever is done with texting, I, I can see how that is really distracting because it uses your hands as well as it distracts your brain. But uh, the others I don't, I don't see a problem with, so I, I will oppose going further with this. But anyway, I'm, I'm okay with this tonight. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Vice Mayor Finn. I just wanted to make one follow-up comment. Can you go back one slide? Yes. So is it back to the uh, statistics? Um, keep, keep one more. Okay, so this, sorry for the pun, but that's a pretty sobering um, statistic there. Six times more dangerous than driving while intoxicated. So I can't imagine a conversation of us saying, we want to make it okay for drivers to drive while they're intoxicated. And this is six times more dangerous. I, I support it. I absolutely support it. I, I've, I've never seen that statistic before. I won't argue the validity of it because I really have no idea. I'm sure there's stats that are behind it, but... Um, <clears throat> anything that is six times more dangerous than driving while intoxicated, I think it's probably a pretty good idea that we want to limit that from happening. So I would definitely support this. Thank you. Councilmember Binsbacher. Thank you, Mayor. I just want to clarify, too, that great point. Um, 
that I agree with. Um, I, to Council Member Hunt's point, I just want to clarify, hands-free I see as very different than handling the electronic in any way, whether you're talking on the phone or texting or anything. Um, so I think hands-free is okay, um, especially with today's technology and what's available in the vehicles. But with these statistics that you know, tell us what they tell us, I feel like, I mean, the last thing I wanna do is get in every individual's business, but I just see this as, I just don't see that we have any choice to take some steps to alleviate this problem that is ongoing for all ages. Thank you. Kathy, I want to say one more thing. Council Member Hunt? I, I forgot to add that I really appreciate any education we can do along these mm -hmm. lines. I think that's really the answer. I would prefer that a massive education campaign over even deciding what we're going to do what we're going to decide tonight. Um, I don't think this is a magic bullet to stop people, especially kids, teenagers, uh, from texting. It's just not. But I think uh, with the educational, it's what we had to do with seatbelts. My mother went to her grave refusing to wear a seatbelt because nobody was going to tell her what to do in her car. And there will be people like that. Oh, she didn't go to her grave because she didn't wear a seatbelt. I, I need to say that. Uh, she never, they never had an accident. But um, I think the real part here that we as a city, if we're going to impose this, we really have an obligation for education on this. Just as we were all shocked by that number, and I think that's really shocking and I would almost question where that comes from. But um, I think education and making people really aware of how serious it is, is going to be the answer. And maybe in the driver's education courses, do they still teach driver's ed in school? I don't know. Uh, maybe that needs to be as big a point as the drunk driving, drinking while driving. Um, I, I do believe that they already do teach that, and I think people all know that they shouldn't read while they're driving. You know, who, who thinks that makes sense, that I'm going to just now read instead of looking at the road and driving? Um, but people all think they can do it for just one second, or just, I can read it real fast. You know, it, it doesn't affect me, even though they're swaying into the lane where I am right next door to them there, and they're practically hitting my car. So I am very much in favor of us doing this. I am pleased that we are making it a primary offense so that our officers really can pull people over for this and educate them, because I think they, they definitely need some education. So. Um, so it sounds to me like we have a consensus that we want to move forward with this, but we'd like to see what, um, the, what the plan will be for community outreach. You know, we need to involve our citizens in this and then um, come back and talk about it again. Great. Thank you, Mayor and members of the council for your, your feedback this evening. And as, as we looked at options, we did struggle with some of the same things that you've brought up this evening. How, how far do we go with the initial, uh, with the initial draft and the initial uh, version of the ordinance? But as I did the research, the numbers were shocking. And you know, to your question about almost questioning the source, I was very, very thorough and diligent, as you can imagine, being the city attorney, making sure that all of my sources were correct and, and solid. And that's why some of the data is, you know, you have 2012 number there. And that's because I wanted to make sure that they were from reputable organizations that were, um, you know, for the purpose of gathering data and gathering information and disseminating it to the public and not necessarily lobbying organizations that were, were geared one way or the other. So, um, I certainly appreciate the feedback this evening, and we will uh, work on an implementation plan, Perfect. and then are happy to bring it back in front of you to get further direction and uh, go from there. That sounds perfect. Okay. Great. Thank you. Great. Appreciate all your work on Absolutely. this. Absolutely. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Did you have something? No. Okay. And we are, we are fine. <laughs> okay, right. I'm going to go ahead and move on to Thank our you. next um, study session item, and that is the follow-up briefing with city codes, and I'm going to turn it over to our city manager, Jeff Tyne. Great. Thank you, Mayor and Council. And our next item is a follow-up uh, from a March 16th 
uh, workshop that the city council had had to talk about our various city codes. Uh, and specifically, it was an overview of the codes that relate to property maintenance, our community standards, and the like. Uh, we focused at that time on efforts to eliminate blighted property and such activities. A lot of good conversation came from that. And it ended with the council expressing their interest in having more public dialogue on this very issue. Because, of course, this really is a lot about the, the various value decisions that come with it. There's always a need for a balance uh, between what are uh, the community standards for safety and appearance uh, and balancing that with individual interests. And likewise, when we get to actual code enforcement and the balance between creating an awareness of an issue and the actual enforcement of that. So because of that, we felt like we should really continue this conversation going forward. And as a result, we have Chris Hallett, our Neighborhood and Human Services Director, will present the study session item. And also, uh, I'd like to introduce Jay Davies, our Deputy Director, and Jack Stroud, Code Compliance Manager, who will assist and provide a PowerPoint presentation with this. So with that, we'll, we'll go to a PowerPoint, and thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jeff, I appreciate it. Mayor and Council, we are here to provide that update, as Jeff said. It's really twofold today, and it's a good opportunity to uh, have a passing, passing of the baton, if you will, in a formal transition of code and compliance from the police department over to the newly formed Neighborhood and Human Services Department. And to do that, we're going to rely upon Jay Davies' expertise one more time. Uh, so today, uh, we're also going to be really focusing on, more importantly, those changes and building upon um, I gotta change this, sorry about uh, Addressing, uh, by doing that, focus the attention on two of the livability topics, uh, that of the built natural environment and public safety. Uh, to do that, uh, Jay and Jack are really gonna build upon some of the conversations you started back in your March 16th retreat setting, uh, where we're going to discuss uh, the variety of vehicle-related issues, commercial and home base related issues, and non-permitted home rehabilitation. Uh, impacts on our community as well as some of the um, things to consider when contemplating any of these code changes. Then we'll wrap it up with some next steps options on how we would like to pursue making those changes to the code enforcement. Uh, Jack will get us started off today with some recent year's uh, performance results and then we'll go into the cursory review from Jay. Good afternoon. Opened 500 or 5,611 cases. Our initial response time overall was an average of two days for, from the time the case opened. Our average closure for start to finish was 30 days. Um, we did personal contacts, that's face to face and on phone. We did 1,103 personal contacts out of the 5,600. Uh, voluntary compliance rate was uh, at 96.6%. That's 500 or 5,420 of the cases. And that's a pretty good uh, rate. We're kind of happy with that. It kind of shows that we're consistent. Our codes are kind of in line. And uh, it's, what, we, it's all, what we're trying to achieve. And our actual enforcement, where the cases actually went to uh, a citation, where we issued a citation, was an average at 3.4%, which is, which is pretty good numbers, too. I'd like to go over the, uh, the chart. Our vehicle and parking, that those numbers reflect, um, it's all parking issues, uh, parking in the front yard, parking in the side yard, illegal parking on the street, uh, in ops that are parked in public view, and it also goes, it also was uh, the RV parking, uh, storing the RV in public view. Landscaping issue, that covers the uh, weeds, uh, overgrown vegetation, um, and then the debris covers anything that's in public view that's stored in public view, boxes, garbage, uh, debris, and such. And then miscellaneous kind of covers anything else, general issues. Uh, with that being said, thank you for, and now I'll turn it over to Jay Davies, and he'll go in more detail with some of the case uh, information or case problem issues. Thank you, Jack. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. We're going to revisit some things we discussed in March, <clears throat> not in quite as great a detail, but to kind of uh, spark that conversation again. Uh, we're going to start with RVs and utility trailers. Uh, again, anything vehicle related accounts for the largest segment of our caseload uh, throughout the year. Uh, RVs and utility trailers are about 18.5% of our, our caseload. 
Some observations we shared with you uh, previously was that at this point we have different rules for parking these vehicles on the street versus on the parcel. Uh, there are differences between RVs, there are differences between parcels which complicate matters. Uh, there's expectation from the public versus the realities of enforcement, which creates a, a gap. Uh, at this point, we are the strictest in the valley with respect to utility trailers and vehicles. Uh, and then uh, there's also some disparity between an open trailer versus a closed trailer, which uh, lends to some confusion as well. Uh, at this point, uh, our recommendation, and, and you'll hear this throughout this presentation, is we, if you so desire, uh, we could provide a, a menu of community livability standards for your review. And what we mean by that is we could draft a series of potential uh, ordinances, language around uh, a variety of standards that would allow you to, to select uh, an ordinance that pointed more close, most closely to the community standard that you wanted to visualize. That's something that we could provide for you if you so desire. And that's our recommendation on several of these, including this one. The next segment is inoperable or abandoned vehicles. They represent about 11% of our code violations. Uh, these are definitely uh, contributors to blight. Uh, with these, in terms of enforcement, uh, we have some search considerations, meaning we're limited in our ability to creep around on somebody's private property and make sure that the plates are valid, which is part of determining a, uh, an inoperable vehicle. Uh, we are consistent with most of the Valley in terms of how we enforce inoperable vehicles and abandoned vehicles. Again, this is an area where we would, uh, if you desire, draft a, a menu of, of standards for you to choose from. One thing that, that kind of jumps out is there's an opportunity to maybe create a minimum distance for moving a vehicle uh, to avoid that abandoned vehicle, move it an inch, and then it's not abandoned sort of uh, situation. But we can uh, explore that if you so desire. The next category is parking on a residential property or front yard parking, as we often call it. It's about 5% of our code cases throughout the year. Uh, with this, we deal with public versus private space, uh, you know, parking on the yard versus parking on the street. The cars are going to park somewhere, and, and each has its pros and cons. Uh, there are dust mitigation concerns, PM10 requirements, legal uh, requirements that uh, any parking take place on a dustproof surface. Uh, zoning requirements vary from area to area in terms of how much of your yard you can use for parking. Uh, and then again, that parcel versus the street. If, if you push all the traffic out to the street, uh, the parking traffic that is, you've got to find that balance for now we have too many cars in the street, not enough on private property. Our recommendation here is, uh, is to not make a change. Uh, at this point, from an enforcement standpoint, it appears that we have a pretty good balance uh, between the yard parking and the street parking. Uh, we, would, we don't necessarily see a, a strong opportunity here, but of course we would uh, entertain your, uh, your interest there as well. Commercial vehicles, a uh, much smaller segment of what we deal with, less than 2% of our total cases. Um, these do impact neighborhoods when you see them you know, parked in public view. Our current weight-based definition is much less restrictive than the rest of the valley. So really compared to our other ordinances where we're more strict than or, or as strict as the valley, in this area we're, we're actually the opposite, much less strict than the rest of the valley. Uh, our recommendation again would be to uh, create a range of community appearance standards in terms of uh, ordinance language for your consideration. Hobby vehicles. Uh, because there is not a hobby vehicle definition, Give you a second to absorb that photo. Uh, because there is not a hobby vehicle definition, we cannot track these numbers in individually. They, they are part of, of a larger set, uh, whether it's um, you know, uh, abandoned vehicles or, or blocking a sidewalk or blocking a driveway. It falls into a number of categories, uh, but definitely can contribute to blight. It can contribute to uh, visibility uh, concerns, uh, even safety concerns uh, in terms of you know, large and multiple vehicles being stored on the street. Our recommendation here would be to pursue a hobby vehicle definition and from there explore private versus public parking limitations for such vehicles. Uh, we would uh, like to point out that with this, these are not treated presently like uh, commercial vehicles, nor would we uh, endeavor to restrict uh, hobby vehicles with respect to passenger vehicles and, and the hobby of restoring you know, classic cars, things of that nature. What we're really talking about, although we haven't crafted a definition, it would really apply more to repurposed commercial vehicles, military vehicles, public safety vehicles, much like what you see here, uh, as opposed to 
refurbishing a, a, you know, a 55 Chevy. That would be something that, that is outside of the scope of what we talk about with a hobby, hobby vehicle. Again, that would come with the definition, but uh, that's really our intent is to target vehicles that are, that are so large that they're different than a passenger vehicle and they're really stored in public view for extended amounts of time. Illegal auto repair businesses, uh, again, there's not a distinct violation there. It's one of many uh, business-related violations that can occur. It might be happening without a license. Uh, it might be happening uh, in a way that's damaging public property. Uh, it might be noise complaints. There's a variety of violations. There's no single violation for this. With that, though, uh, it's important that we differentiate hobbyists and do-it-yourself repair folks from those who are truly doing this as, as a business. Uh, the challenge with enforcement on that is, is those businesses are rarely advertised. We have to prove that money is exchanging hands in those transactions for us to really be able to uh, enforce any sort of uh, penalty on that. Our recommendation here is that uh, we could, again, draft uh, a variety of uh, draft ordinances for your consideration that would limit the commercial activity uh, in this regard. Moving away from vehicles, uh, the next largest category is landscaping. It's about 17% of our code violations. Uh, this is really more of a compliance than, than an ordinance issue, uh, meaning we have a very clear ordinance, you know, six inches, uh, dead vegetation. It's pretty cut and dry, no pun intended. Uh, it does tend to be a seasonal issue. Spring and fall, we see the weeds uh, more of, of an issue. Uh, and the, the fact that we have what we feel is a, is a pretty clear ordinance our recommendation is more in terms of, of an educational approach. Uh, we would look to pursue uh, an educational campaign of sorts, uh, educating homeowners about the best remedies, the best timing, uh, kind of a, a strategic approach to, to resolving your, your landscaping issues. We would also leverage that with code enforcement uh, pairing under Neighborhood and Human Services with the tool lending program, make sure folks are aware of the resources that are available to them that are, that are free and that we can assist with. Uh, so that's more of an educational approach to the landscaping issue. Debris, uh, this represents 12% of our code violations. Uh, again, this is more of a compliance uh, than an ordinance issue as well. Uh, with this, again, we would look for a, uh, a campaign of educating the public about such things as what the bulk pickup schedule is with respect to outdoor storage, uh, information on how to access the landfill, what items are allowed to be stored outside and, and what aren't, where you're allowed to have them, what percentage of your parcel can be uh, those, those sorts of uh, pieces of information that would be helpful in an education campaign. Moving to signs, a uh, very small segment of our, our uh, code case, it's uh, 5% uh, on an annual basis. Signs are very popular with business owners. Uh, they tend to be growing in popularity. <clears throat> They're seen as a low-cost advertising tool. Uh, they can provide uh, not only concerns for safety, uh, for safety visibility, uh, but also blight if they're allowed to <clears throat> proliferate too much. Uh, blight becomes a concern. Uh, visual pollution sometimes is the term. Our recommendation, and some of this is already underway, <clears throat> and that is to review the allowable coverage that, that signs can, uh, can occupy and seek consistent and reasonable allowances to find that balance between supporting what businesses are trying to do versus maintaining that uh, a low level of blight. And we have non-permitted home rehabilitation or building without a permit is really what we're talking about. Just about 3% of our code caseload for the year. Uh, this can be a public safety issue. Uh, obviously, different levels of craftsmanship come into play here without a permit. And <clears throat> for those that, that think it you know, doesn't really hurt anybody else, we'd like to educate folks that it, it can actually affect your own assessed valuation if you start you know, creating uh, additional square footage that, that, that starts to impact the, the valuation of your home that isn't properly permitted. Uh, on this, again, we would, we would endeavor to pursue an education campaign highlighting those safety matters, the resale matters, and other considerations uh, from an educational standpoint. And with that, I'm going to hand things back over to Chris. All right. Thank you, Jay. Uh, Mayor and Council, you saw there's a variety of issues uh, impacting our neighborhoods and businesses. Uh, in order to meet your expectations on any potential code changes, we'd like to ask a couple leading questions to get your feedback. In particular, are there any other codes the City Council would like to review? Uh, what time frame might we want to be looking at code changes? 
and in what venue might be best suited? Uh, do you want to do it in a future council study session, retreat or workshop? We can bring them here certainly on a case-by-case -case review basis or any other option you might want to consider. So um, before we get into any of these things, first of all, I'd like to ask council if you've got any discussion or um, questions that you specifically want to ask some of the speakers. Okay, start with Council Member Patena. And by the way, he worked in code for 18 years for the city of Peoria, is that yeah, correct? That's correct. Just gonna throw that out there. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. So, uh, Jay, I'd like to ask, for years, code was led to believe that after a uh, household was given a notification of a violation, that they had 30 days to remedy that situation and then the code would go back out and then if they didn't remedy it, they get, got 30 more days. And then, then we found out a little over a year ago that, that that wasn't factual. So my question is, are you, are you still using the 30-day or have you lessened that time? Okay. Well, Jack, he does the work, okay. so. Mayor and Council Patena, uh, yeah, when, when I took over the, the program, it was seven and 10 days. We, we used seven days for the first notice and then seven days for the second notice. Okay and 10 days for out of state or out of county. Okay. But uh, 30 days, I'm not aware of the 30 days. Are you still using seven days? We are using seven days, yes. Okay. Is it seven to 10 days. Okay, thank you. Council Member Binsbacher. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, okay, I, a couple of things. Um, are you, do you separate the code enforcement as it relates to residential versus commercial? Or is it all together? Mayor and Council Binsbacher, uh, they are separated to a point. Um, that they, they fall under the same city codes and international property maintenance codes. We still deal with them the same. The inspectors treat them the same way. Uh, they still get the same t type of time frame unless they're out of state or we can't get hold of the LLC, then we give them additional time. But they are treated, they're the same city codes that we follow and zoning ordinances for, okay. for residential versus commercial. So uh, could you go back a couple slides to the sign there, right there? So, um, okay, staff reviewing allowable coverage. Okay, so there's current code in place. I think we've talked a lot about with everything, communication and education is key. And I think through some things happening in my district recently, I think we've learned a lot about how to communicate with businesses. And I think I'm really excited about what's what's in the works there. Um, but again, finding balance, because when you look at a situation like this, you know, the code is very black and white, but then you've got the Hunter chiropractic that has very tasteful signage, um, but is out of compliance. And then up here in the top left, I don't even know what the name of that store is, but that could be considered blight. And so I think it's such a fine line between you know, what works and what doesn't. And so I know that's a big job, um, but a, a real sensitive area. And so my, what I'm looking for, and again, I know there's some great things in the works, is how we communicate and educate our businesses as we move forward. I think that's key. Um, so it's not so much the what, but the how. Um, with regard to businesses out of the home, particularly um, the... Uh, Airbnbs, is there a specific code against being able to do that in your home? How does that work? Mayor and Council Binsbacher, no, no, there isn't a specific code that's against that. That's treated as a rental, a home rental. We've actually are looking into that to see if we can tie that to something else. But okay. right now we're treating it as a typical rental. Okay, and that's for when someone opens up the entire home and allows people to rent that home for one night or weeks? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, it, the, the code doesn't distinguish between time frames, whether you do a 30-day <coughs> rental or a one-year rental or a one-day rental. And what if somebody breaks it down to, you know, locking each individual room within the house and renting those out individually? That would fall under a different situation where if they if they created if they had leases for every individual that was in the house then you'd fall into either a, a boarding house of some sort okay it would fall under a different code we'd treat that with a different 
uh, ordinance. But those are all issues yet to be addressed. Yes, ma'am. Um, I believe we are looking at the Airbnb type of situation, okay. but the other we are not. Okay. So this seems to be a growing issue in all communities. So I, it's just come up recently in my district. So I just, I'm trying to understand it without having to read code from start to finish because, you know. Um, but I will, I will definitely be sharing those instances then so that you can look at those examples. Thank you. Vice Mayor Finn. Thank you. Um, I wanted to make at least one comment. Um, I, I really don't want to gloss over the fact that we have 96.6% mm -hmm. um, success rate of, of yeah. this getting resolved. I think that to me is extremely important, that we're going out and we're giving people an opportunity to fix it, we're communicating with them. I, I think that's a remarkable number. So I want to applaud you and, and all of your works and um, trying to resolve that and with voluntary compliance. I think that's fantastic. So kudos out to you. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, I do have a question on where we have to have actual enforcement though. Even though it's 3.4%, 191 cases, where does the majority of actual enforcement fall in, in these categories? Is it is it the landscaping, the debris? Where, where are the majority of those? Mayor and Council Finn, uh, Councilman Member Finn, um, it falls. It's a variety. Okay. It, it's a it, it's not in one specific location. Okay. Okay. And then one final question: IPMC. What does that stand for? And how That's the International range? Property Maintenance Code that we've adopted. Ah, gotcha. Thank you. I left my Dakota ring at home. So, okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. Council Member Edwards. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so this is not necessarily on the list, but it has to do with um, commercial. So I've seen a growing number of, I know they're not called storage containers, but I know there's another word for them, and like it eludes me right now. Connex. There you go. Please. And it, it, it's when businesses are doing remodels, uh, or businesses are using these because they've run out of room, and so they're using these as storage facilities, and I'm seeing them popping up more and more. And I know that they're under code enforcement, and I know we're doing the best, but this kind of goes back to uh, when a permit is applied for for a remodel of a, a business. What, is it, what standards are we putting in place that basically says you have X amount of days to have that storage facility there, and if you go over that, that allotment, fine, you go out and you, you cite them, but it's six, six months later that that storage container is there. It's no longer considered, at least in my opinion, it would not be a remodel at that point. It's extra space that they are now using as as storage facility. So what are we doing to maybe in the permitting process, process of making it very clear that you cannot have these facilities out there, or these units out there for an extended period of time because they are becoming a blight issue. Mayor and Council Member Edwards, um, right now um, I can't answer that what we're doing about the storage containers as far as the permits. We are monitoring work locations. When the, they pull the permits and we go out there and we, we see that there's construction that's prolonging or going on for a long period of time. We actually open a case on that and we'll monitor it for so many days and, and, and hold them to a, a certain date of completion date. What about a, what about a unit that's uh, on, a par, on a parcel that's actually being used to house motorcycles? There's a variety of uh, different connexes that are out there in the city, you are correct. Um, uh, there's certain guidelines and criteria and, and stipulations that they're supposed to follow and that particular case right there we are we do have an open case on that and they will have to follow certain guidelines it's treated as an accessory structure in that situation where um, it would have to fall it would have to fall under certain requirements to be allowed there and like what screening uh, screening, screening setback the, requirements okay and, si it, and whatever the size is or if it's being used consistently then I mean obviously then it then it would fall under some building code requirements, yeah, it correct? Would. Because it if it's would. being consistently used, I would think that, that our building code would be stepping in and saying that it doesn't meet our standards for a building because right. it's being used as a building and not as storage facility. Right. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Hunt. <clears throat> I just wanted to remind you, we do have a bed and breakfast code or ordinance, so that might lay the groundwork for, I know because I wrote it in 1998, so we have a bed and breakfast code. We no longer have a bed and breakfast in Peoria, but now we have all these Airbnbs. So for guidelines, it seems to me that might be the place to start. 
Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Leone. Go all the way back to the end. On the Yeah, I'd like to find out, when I first started in 99, it was all different cold people was here, altogether different. But I'd like to find a, a couple of things. Number one, somebody that has weeds or a junk car on the side of the house, how many days do you give them to get rid of it? Mayor and Council, Council Member Leone, um, typically a day, if, if it's a first occurrence, we typically give them seven to 10 days. Seven days. That's, that's the first notice, and then we'll give them a second notice, a final notice. This is a seven, and ten, seven to 10 days additional. So you give them 14 days? Yes, up to 20. Then you give them 10 days after that no, but to no, go to court? Well, the, go, to go to court, it could take up to 30 days. Once we issue the citation, if we do issue a citation, we, we set the court dates out 30 days. Well, why do we give them 14 days when it only takes a few minutes to pull a weed or get somebody doing for you or move a junk car? Why can't we cut it down just as strictly seven days? We, uh, council Member Leone, we could do that if that's what the council wants us to do. Okay, now, I remember when I first started if you parked on the side of the house on rocks, it was illegal. Now I guess you can do it, and I never knew they changed the ordinance on that, if there was an ordinance. Mayor and Council Member Leone, uh, I'm not aware that that ordinance did change. There is a driveway requirement where you're allowed to legally park your vehicle, and if it's on a dustproof surface and rock is considered a dustproof surface, it's up to three inches, they are allowed to park there. Then can, you, and then can you park in front of the house, I mean on the grass, by the front door? No. No. Not in the front yard, no. Okay, I got a lot more, but I will be here all day, so I'll, that's what I wanted to know. Thank you. Well, thank you. We appreciate this presentation as well as um, all the information that we received at our uh, work study session a couple months ago. But I think that there's still a lot of work to be done. And you mentioned the expectations from the public versus what is actually the reality in terms of code and, and our ordinance. And that is a big deal. I think that discrepancy speaks volumes. We really have to get those two things together where what we are doing One makes more sense. One more question. All right. Mr. Leone? <laughs> uh, I understand that we're not allowed to go in the backyard. Is that right? How can we get Aaron, that changed? Council Member Leone, um, it, it, it is a privacy thing. We're not allowed to actually go on private property without a warrant. But what if, what if the gate is wide open? It's still private property. We're only allowed to go from the street to the front door. So they can have four or five junk cars in the backyard and all these can, cans and bottles in the backyard all over the place, and nothing we can do about it? Mayor and Council Member Leone, there is some stuff that we can do about that. If, if it's public view or can be considered in public view, we can, we can deal with that. We can address that. If we can see it, if the neighbor sees it, uh, we, can, we can go off of that. If it's public view, we've got to be able to access it. So I understand that if you go to the house next door and they got two floors and you go upstairs and look out the window and you see all that stuff, then can you just do something about it? Mayor and Council Member Leone, um, that is considered public view and we can use that to observe what's in the backyard. Thank you. Okay. So, we need to do some further action on this. And because of that discrepancy, I think um, 
you know, there's gotta be a way that we can get some public input on this too, so that our, that our citizens, so that we're doing something that our citizens can comprehend in a little bit better of a, of a manner. And I love that you said that you wanted to create a menu um, of items that would bring us back to the community livability standards that we expect. I, I mean, I think that's great to tie it back to our goals. I don't know why we, we didn't think of that in the past, but it's a, it's a perfect place for us to begin with all of these. And so I would suggest um, at this point putting together an ad hoc committee, subcommittee of the mayor uh, and having some of our council members on it. And, and I would like to point out that Vice Mayor Finn has had some extensive um, code compliance issues in his district and he would, not, person. not personally, <laughs> right? Um, but some things that really need to, some resolution. And so I would like you yeah. to head up uh, the mayor's ad hoc subcommittee on code compliance and, and council member Patena, your experience, you know, yeah, leads you uh, to be the perfect person to also head that up. Uh, so if the two of you could um, work with our code, go out, talk to our citizens, find out ways that we can bring this code, uh, decrease that discrepancy between what our citizens expect and what we are actually delivering and um, tie it all back to our community liv livability standards. I think that's a perfect solution. Happy to do it. You have two weeks. No. <laughs> no, I will let you decide um, how you want to start that and, and how you're going to conduct your public meetings and how much time you want to spend with, with code in advance of that. And um, Mr. Tyne, if you would help round that out, I would certainly appreciate it. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Everyone good? Good. With that, then we are adjourned. did a pretty extensive uh, review um, and because of the level of service and that there's no need for a second access um, there's no need uh, to pursue that but uh, the applicant knowing that uh, the residents were in concern or were concerned about that tried to um, talk to the commercial um, owner of that property and try to negotiate with them and it, it did not go through it, those negotiations failed. Um, and, but the main thing is that that issue has been addressed. Uh, traffic can explain that a little bit more. The applicant can explain their efforts to try and provide a second access, but there was never any uh, rigid requirement for it, if that makes sense. And so because of that, we decided that it would not be prudent to have that as a requirement as a condition, and so we had it removed. I didn't think that 20 feet was enough for good, safe vehicle ac access anyway, but it seemed to me it would be prudent to have pedestrian access to the commercial at that point. Was there any discussion with the commercial properties about allowing pedestrian access? That's, that's kind of one of my pet peeves on developments like this, is you gotta, walk all the way down to the arterial street and circle back to yeah. get to a store. And if you got a pedestrian access, it might cut down your traffic in and out of the project. Mr. Chair, Commissioner Patterson, um, I, I love connectivity as well and, and try and push that whenever I can. Um, uh, it was an effort to get vehicular and pedestrian access and both uh, those efforts were rejected by that property owner. Uh, and the applicant can allude to that a little bit more. Um, but again, it wasn't something that's required or necessary as, as Chris and traffic has pointed out. Um, there's no need for that. Yeah, I just think we get great planning if it could happen. 
Commissioner Patterson, if I could add to it, um, if we go back to the graphic, there's a 30-foot uh, drainage easement in there, so it does make it more challenging to put pedestrians uh, within that corridor as well because there could be inundation with water being stored in that area. So that was one of the reasons why we also didn't uh, have the pedestrian access in the middle of the site as well. So there's a drainage yeah. easement in there. Yeah, you could easily put in a fairly inexpensive bridge. Yeah. All right, any further questions from commissioners? I'm gonna open the public hearing. Is the applicant present? Yes. Do you wish to speak, sir? Uh, yes, thank you. Terrific, please state your name and address for the record if you would, please. <laughs> Magic little, perfect. Thank you, my apologies. Uh, Chair, members of the commission, my name is Brennan Ray, 702 East Osborne, here on behalf of the applicant Next Metro Communities, uh, who is the proposed developer for a Via Lago. Um, Next Metro uh, is excited to be uh, presenting this case uh, to the commission tonight. Uh, they are an Arizona-based company, uh, offices in Phoenix, and have multiple developments that they have constructed uh, and that are under construction and that are planned. Uh, throughout the Phoenix metro area, as well as across the United States and in, in adjacent states. Uh, and so they're excited to be able to bring this to Peoria. Uh, we have worked, as <clears throat> Sean alluded to and as Chris alluded to, we have worked closely, hand in glove, with planning and traffic uh, to ensure that this development is well designed, uh, compatible with the surrounding area, and is a viable and sustainable solution on a very challenging infill site. Um, we appreciate the feedback that we've received from the neighbors as we've gone along the way. Um, and we think that the layout of the proposed development uh, has kept in mind our neighbors, in particular, the Ventana Lakes community on our north and kind of west sides, and I'll touch on that. Um, but we believe that this proposed uh, development for this, again, infill site is consistent with good planning principles, as staff alluded to. It provides a, a, a natural transition from more intense uses out on the uh, corner uh, to our east, transitioning to less intense uses being the single family residences to our north and west. Um, we are, uh, appreciate certainly staff's thoroughness of their staff report in the presentation tonight. We are consistent with the general plan goals and policies. Uh, obviously we're proposing an amendment to it, but we're certainly, there is support there. We're okay with the revised stipulations one through seven, and we would request uh, this commission's recommendation for approval in accordance with staff's uh, recommendation. Uh, I do have a presentation tonight uh, I'm going to be very brief, again, because of the thoroughness of which uh, Sean went through things. I just want to touch on and highlight a few things. Um, we're all certainly very familiar with the site, um, but as we, as we look at it and to uh, address one of the comments that was uh, made, in particular, access to the east. Um, if you look closely on this, as well. And so we did, uh, um, staff, we did work with staff early on uh, to see what, if anything, could be done about access to the east. Um, because uh, it certainly makes sense on a lot of levels uh, when you start to look at it on paper, but when you start to drill down to it, uh, apart from the traffic reasons, uh, and we had our traffic engineer work with Chris to make sure that our Beardsley access was fine. <clears throat> we kind of run into a, a couple of challenges, the 30-foot easement being first and foremost. Uh, it's a little hodgepodge of, uh, of improvements, of landscaping, and at the end of the day, uh, there was a fundamental concern of our part of dumping pedestrians into the back of house, uh, the back of these businesses. Um, I can't, 
I'm not good at pointing, but about where that Pleasant Promenade building starts, um, a little bit north of there, there is a wall uh, that is on the common property line on, that, on our west eastern side that runs all the way north. So we're kind of limited with some of the existing improvements that are in place there. And again, down at that Walgreens, if I remember right, the west side of the Walgreens building uh, is a drive-through. And so dumping pedestrian uh, traffic uh, into that area, we didn't feel it would be safe and prudent, uh, not only for our residents, but for the users of that site as well. Um, and so we, we did look at it. We, we did run, run the gauntlet. Um, speaking with those adjacent property owners um, before we ever had our neighborhood meeting, and then following up with them after hearing some of the concerns coming out of that neighborhood meeting. And each time we were rebuffed uh, in our efforts to try to secure some type of access uh, to the east. Um, just a couple of things, uh, again, not gonna belabor it uh, um, uh, in terms of the layout, but there's a quick little summary of what's going on. I think the key thing that I'd like to note on this and that, that Sean brought up is that the, the amount of, of common and private open space that we're providing, that on this you know, challenging infill site that's a little over 11 acres, we're providing a little less than two acres worth of common and public, common and private open space. Uh, and where, we, uh, where would that leads us to, and a lot of the questions that we asked is, why would someone choose this, or what kind of people would want to live in this type of a development? And so this is a, a quick summary of that um, for the residents uh, within Peoria to understand as well, in that this development represents a lifestyle choice. Um, people choose to live here. Uh, you'll see there that we have a, a strong showing of people over the age of 35. We have people, uh, a, a fair number that are single women. Um, a lot of them have come from single family homes because this type of a project, excuse me, development <clears throat> combines the best of single family living with multifamily characteristics. Um, and you can see that, I won't run through all of that, but clearly these are the type of people that could um, otherwise uh, afford a home but choose for whatever reason uh, that they don't want to deal with that. This next slide uh, gives you an idea of kind of the typical courtyard layout. I know that, that, that this commission is familiar with the bungalows, um, but each of these is laid out in groups of four uh, with an entrance to these buildings of four. All of them have private rear yards uh, that are landscaped and an opportunity to, do, to uh, go out there uh, if you have a dog or, or a pet, have it go out there. There's enough space there that if they wanted to put up a barbecue, some tables and chairs and umbrellas and stuff, there's plenty of room back there. And we found in the course of, of talking to our existing residents that this was, this feature, this private rear yard was something that really attracted them to this type of development. Um, in terms of the elevations, uh, there they are. Sean presented them to you. The one thing that I would note and clarify in our request is that it was, uh, we are requesting a deviation for one story, 25 feet in height. The 25 feet does not come from these buildings. It comes from our leasing office up in the front. Typically, as you can see on those, most of our, on average, to our peak is about 17 feet in height. Uh, so this is an entire one story community. That additional 25 feet is just for the leasing office up in front. Um, it's always one thing to see something on paper. It's another thing to see actual photos. This is an example of the pitch roof product at another development. Um, obviously, the elevations uh, that are in your book are the ones that are in the packet are the ones that we're going to be building. But wanted to give you and, and the residents an opportunity to see some actual um, photographs of what this looks like uh, in a built condition. Um, obviously, staff did a real thorough job talking about the amenities. One of the things that I would just focus on this is the idea was to create social gathering areas where residents are able to, to meet and socialize and interact with one another, and we believe that we've accomplished that. Um, this next slide is an example, again, of that leasing office. Uh, those are full windows up at the top. It's not a second story. Uh, they're for decorative purposes only, but can kind of give you a, a flavor and feel of what the pool area will look like. 
Um, we've worked really hard with staff uh, to come up with a good pedestrian circulation plan, and you can see that, and Sean highlighted it. Um, obviously, the goal is to be able to move people through the site and to be able to take our residents in the north and bring them down uh, to the south as well. And that's what that blue dashed line is. Uh, that's the trail that, or that pathway that Sean uh, had in his report uh, with opportunities for benches. You can see that typical depiction there on the left. Let me just touch briefly again on, on the open house. Um, and again, as, as Sean indicated, there were lots of questions and comments, and I'm gonna focus it on really two areas, this north area and then the traffic issues. One of the biggest things you can see in the lower left-hand corner of that slide is what looks like uh, spackling, I guess, is the best way to describe it. But that, uh, um, that heads out west to 103rd Avenue. We heard loud and clear uh, the concern about we don't want to connect. We don't, they, the neighbors, don't want us to connect to the Ventana Lakes community. And um, we didn't want to either. Uh, and so uh, through working with traffic to be able to make sure our Beardsley Road functioned properly, we're able to, to tell them and to tell you and to represent uh, that that is planned to be an emergency access only. Um, so that was important. The other thing that we did um, to the discussion earlier is we have increased those setbacks along those rear yards. Uh, we've upsized the trees that are going to be planted there so that they're a little bit bigger at the time of planting. Um, and you can see uh, in the orange color, there was a question about lights and what is there going to be spillage or pollution. And so there is a, a, a condition, not a condition, but wording in the PAD report uh, as well that all our lighting is going to be downward directed and shielded. And so we knew that was important. Again, there is a grade differential. The Ventana Lake side sits up higher than we do. So recognizing that, that that's the case, we wanted to make sure we had it nice for them up there. I'm not gonna belabor the, the, the traffic issue um, other than if you wanted to see it in, in kind of detail, uh, the proposed uh, modification to that medium, that's in that black box there. Uh, with the current aerial underneath, and then you can kind of see the yellow text that indicates, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, what changes are going to be made there to be able to accommodate and to ensure that the same level of service that exists, whether we're there or not, which is a level of service C, as, as traffic indicated, continues to be maintained. And uh, Chris is confident, our private traffic engineer is confident as well, that we'll be able to maintain the level of service that currently exists there today. So with that, again, I, I tried to be brief, but I, there were a few things that I felt I needed to emphasize. Uh, again, we feel that this is a high quality development on a very challenging infill site with limited access. Um, again, we believe it's an appropriate transitional use, appropriate when you consider uh, transition of densities and intensities. Uh, appropriate uh, in terms of it being a good solution for an under undeveloped site that's been vacant for a long time and kind of completes the development in the area. And we certainly appreciate uh, the working with staff on all of these issues. Uh, and again, uh, we are okay with the, the stipulations that have been presented tonight, and we would request this body's approval, a recommendation for approval in accordance with staff's recommendation. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. If not, I've got other members of the development team here that are able to answer questions as well. So with that, I'll stop. Thank you. Do we, uh, any commissioners have any questions of Mr. Ray, is it? Yes, it is. I have a couple. Um, oops, sorry, oh, now I have two popping up here. I'm gonna get to, get to these first then. Commissioner Patterson, you're first up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, I understand what you're saying about the pro professional plaza not being your typical commercial attractor for the people that live uh, adjacent to the property, but there is a shopping center on the east side of Lake Pleasant Road that people might want to walk to. Um, what would be the downside of keeping the, the access, access easement requirement in, but rather than being a vehicular access easement, make it a pedestrian access easement? 
uh, through the chair, Commissioner Patterson, uh, without going through all the reasons why, I, and, and I won't do that, uh, one, of the, one of the challenges that we face with a, with a stipulation such as that is in order for me to comply with it, it requires compliance and, and cooperation from others uh, because it in effect requires me to go try to secure that, <clears throat> those rights across private property that is owned by private individuals. And I can tell you we've done that. Uh, we've made multiple attempts. Uh, not only were the neighbors encouraging us to do this, uh, the councilman whose district we're in uh, made, a, made a special request of me uh, and our group to be able to go try and secure that access. And it was not something that, that we could do. And again, based on everything that everyone said, we don't feel it's needed, we don't feel it's appropriate, we've got good circulation running through the site that allows people to be able to access the public sidewalks so that if and in the event they want to, uh, they would be able to go to the east. Additionally, if you were to look at it and say, okay, uh, Mr. Ray Brennan, I, I hear what you're saying. At the end of the day, I'm not aware, and, I, and I'll be, I could be corrected on this. I think if anyone wanted to go east across Lake Pleasant Road, they would need to go down to the intersection oh, anyway, right. <laughs> where there is a lighted traffic signal to provide safe passage across that. So at the end of the day, everybody is going to be funneled to uh, that intersection in order to head east unless there's another pedestrian crossing way along Lake Pleasant that I'm not aware of. Yeah. I understand that you can't do the access to that adjacent property today without the, the approval of the property owner, but uses on that corner could change over time. Ownership can change. Uh, feelings about access could change. And it just seems to me like it would be good to at least preserve the option for a future connection of do things do change in the future? Commissioner Artlewski? Yeah, so I had a similar kind of, you know, thought as Commissioner Patterson did about it, but I, I see your point that you would have to come down to the light no matter what, and I, I can almost guess that some of the problems with doing that was the, the liability issues of walking through the back of a parking lot and then through. Um, so yeah, so I guess, you know, I would say that I, I'm kind of okay with that at this point. What I'd really like to just say is thank you for, for choosing Peoria to do this. Um, we're seeing a lot of infill uh, lately and we like it. I know that for communities and residents near an infill, sometimes it's not easy. Um, but it looks like you've done a wonderful job. I, I know, and I can't think of the development up at Aldi, the name of it, but up at Lake Pleasant and Happy Valley, that's going to be exactly what we were talking about, where the residents, it's a, it's a leasing community, they have restaurants and coffee shops they can walk to. Uh, I guess for them it was all built at the same, it was going to be built at the same time, makes life a lot easier for them. But. Uh, we definitely appreciate you guys bringing that to us, and I think you have a, a wonderful idea here, and I think we'll probably see more of this in the future, hopefully up here in this area. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Commissioner Lewski. Uh, just a couple of quick questions, and I apologize if I missed it in your report, but do we have an idea of what would the, the range of rents be for these units? Uh, I didn't say it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if you don't know, you don't know, but uh, I figure yeah. you may have a rough idea. Um, you know, that, that's always a good question, and it's, it's, it's really tough to tell. I know that where we are anticipating the range um, based on other uh, communities similarly situated, we, expect, we would expect the one bedroom uh, to be anywhere from maybe $1,100 up to $1,200, somewhere in there. Uh, the two bedroom uh, would be anywhere between $1,400 and $1,500. And then the three, did I say one bedroom, two bedroom? I meant two bedroom, two bedroom yes, thank you. Uh, then the three bedroom in terms of a range would be anywhere from, call it 1,600 up to 1,700 uh, a month. Okay, where does that fall in the range of, uh, I haven't rented an apartment for quite a while, does that tend to be kind of a upscale apartment uh, or rental rate or is that kind of middle of the road? No, that is, um, <clears throat> through the chair, uh, that type of rent would be considered A plus rent uh, in terms of compared to rental market. Okay.
thank you for that. And then one last question is, uh, would management remain on site 24 seven or will the, the managers live on site or do they close up shop at six and come back in the morning? So uh, chairman, the way that I understand that to work is that during the lease up phase, there will be uh, an employee on there on site uh, that will be there, you know, normal business hours uh, until it's leased up. Uh, at that point, uh, I believe the leasing uh, person will leave and go to another place. But there is a management company that will go and, and visit the site uh, to check on it to make sure the maintenance is taken care of um, and things like that. But in terms of once it's leased up, I don't believe there's anyone there 24 hours a day. But there is obviously a 24 hour <coughs> management company that people can call with any problems or challenges that they have. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for commissioners? I have a uh, speaker request form. Ms. Ernest, do I have any others that have come in? Just the one? All right. I'd like to call up Eileen, and I apologize if I mess up your name here. Demoloitz? Demo? Demoloitz. Oh, I almost had it. If you could uh, approach the uh, microphone and state your name and address for the record, please. My name is Eileen Demeloitz. My address is 10416 West Runyon Drive in Peoria. I am a resident of Ventana Lakes Development, and I am concerned, and some of my neighbors are concerned, about the easement to the east. If you allow the developer to drop that, that they don't need to have an easement to the east, there's no place else for the cars to go if they need them. Uh, right at the moment, as we speak, they are building 69 houses on Beardsley and 107th Avenue. That's going to contribute to the traffic. We do not want, we at Ventana Lakes do not want people from a Via Lago going out the emergent, in and out the emergency exit. If you have, if you look at it, the south has houses built there. The north is Beardsley. The east, they're saying they can't get an easement. The only thing that is left is that emergency entrance and exit. We would like some sort of assurance that that emergency exit will always be only an emergency exit. That's it. Can I take your question? Sure. Uh, you said we at Ventana Lakes. Are you representing the HOA or are you just no, speaking for yourself individually? No, I am representing my neighbors. Your group over there. Okay, perfect. Yes. I just want to make sure I understood. Thank you. Does the applicant have any rebuttal or additional comments they want to make based on what we just heard? Uh, chairman, uh, members of the commission, um, it, it, with respect to the comments in terms of access, um, I think we've discussed it a lot um, in terms of the access to the east. Um, I'm not sure what else we can do. Uh, it's clear on the plans. It's clear on uh, staff's mind, uh, it's clear on the conceptual development plan uh, that it is emergency access only. Um, I'm not sure what else we would need to do, but I, I can assure you that uh, the plan is that that not be there. In fact, if I may, technically, uh, I do have an easement that allows public access uh, to Ventana Lakes. That was part of the original development that, that went in there with the storage solution as I understand it. Uh, we are foregoing those legal rights that we have today uh, to restrict it to emergency only. Uh, and it's, I think, abundantly clear in the plans we've presented in staff's report, my report today, that that will be emergency access. Uh, if I can make one clarification as well, I, I'm gonna take the opportunity, in terms of someone there on site, I was corrected by my client. Uh, even after lease up, there is a person that is on site uh, during normal business hours. Great, thank you for clarifying that. I'm gonna close the public hearing now. Are there uh, any further questions or comments from commissioners before we take action? Uh, and we're gonna be taking action, just as a reminder, 
Uh, first, on case GPA 18-01, <coughs> the general plan amendment for this property. Do we have any questions? Yeah. Oops, sorry here, my... Raise your hand, because my thing isn't working yeah. here. All right, okay. sorry about that. Commissioner um, Altluski? I guess this is for Sean. I know um, in Trilogy we have several emergency exit areas, and they all have a gate um, chain across them. On this emergency exit, will that have any blockage at all to stop residents from going into Ventana Lakes? Um, Mr. Chair, Commissioner Atluski, I believe, I, if I'm not mistaken, there's a gate there right now. I believe that's to remain. So that's going to stay. So, they, so a resident could not just randomly drive out that way. Correct. Uh, fire trucks would have access through keys and getting in and out. That would be correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Altluski. Commissioner Patterson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I agree. I, I think it's a great project. Um, I can't imagine a better thing to go in in this awkward development. Um, my only, as I've already stated, my reservation is the, the access to the east. And I would like to make a motion that we keep the easement as a requirement, but call it a pedestrian access, not vehicular access. Okay, do you want to, uh, you're making a motion. Yes. Do you want to go ahead and make that motion? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I, I move to return to the original conditions as originally presented that include an access easement, easement, but change the wording to make it a pedestrian easement. Staff, okay with that? Mr. Chair, uh, Commissioner Patterson, I mean, you certainly have the, the right to make that motion. Uh, but, you know, as, as the uh, revised exhibit uh, alludes to, we, we do not support keeping that condition in there. We have vetted uh, all efforts to try and, and um, uh, obtain some sort of access to the east to just appease uh, those concerns that have been voiced today. Uh, we recognize it's, it's a good planning technique, but when you're dealing with an existing development that isn't willing to uh, work with you uh, and it's not required, then, um, then we look at other avenues, and, and this project does provide uh, accessible uh, pedestrian access to Beardsley, which then would lead to the safest uh, pedestrian crossing, as, as Brennan alluded to, uh, to those re uh, businesses to the east. And, and so I think, uh, in the end, we, we get what we want. It's just not um, the most ideal situation that if it was all new, we could, we could certainly integrate that access that you're talking about. Yeah, my only point is things change over time and we're giving away an opportunity by not getting easement now. Well, we have a motion on the table. Do I have a second to the motion that was just made? Okay, hearing none, motion dies. Uh, do I have a new motion? Commissioner, I motion that we approve Minor General Plan Amendment Case GPA 18-01 as presented by staff. Thank you, Commissioner Alsop. Do I have a second? I'll second that. Thank you, Commissioner Altluski. We have a motion and a second. Please vote. And it passes unanimously. Next, we're going to look at rezoning case Z18-02 related to this. Uh, any further questions or comments from commissioners before we take action on case Z18-07? Seeing none, do I have a motion? I'll make a motion to uh, recommend Z18-02 approval to the city council uh, with any conditions from staff. Thank you, Commissioner Lewski. May I have a second? Second. Thank you, Commissioner Alsop. We have a motion and a second. Commissioners, please vote. And it passes unanimously. Thank you. We're going to move on next to new business and consider rezoning request for Harvest Church. It's item 4R on the agenda. Case number Z. Uh, I'm probably going to get this wrong. Z18-07.
A request to rezone approximately 5.12 acres from light industrial I-1 to suburban ranch SR-43 in order to develop a new phase of the Harvest, Harvest Church campus. The site is located north and west of the northwest corner of 83rd Avenue and Northern Avenue. Staff, please present your report. Good evening, members of commission. My name is Randy Proach. I'll be presenting tonight's yes. item, Harvest Church. This is Z18-07, a rezoning request. The applicant this evening is the pastor of the church, Dr. Ron Rockwell. This is located just north and just west of the northwest <clears throat> corner of 83rd Avenue and Northern Avenue. The site is just over five acres. Uh, the site is currently zoned I-1. The request this evening is to go to SR-43, our suburban ranch, in order to facilitate an expansion of the church campus. Uh, you may recall that a few months ago we applied initial zoning to the existing Harvest Church site that's just to the left of the outlined parcel. That took the parcel in question from RU-43, the Maricopa County uh, Rural Residential Zoning District, to our SR-43. This area is a mix of mostly large lot homes in a rural environment. There is a small amount of industrial users just to the east of 83rd Avenue across the street. Now this proposal does not include the hard corner, hence why we have reiterated just to the north and just to the west of this intersection as the hard corner is currently RV sales and still located within a county island. This is the overall uh, conceptual development plan for the site uh, should the proposal move forward. This red box indicates the parcel in question for tonight's rezoning request. The yellow area now highlighted is the extent of the expansion. Everything to the left of the yellow shaded box is the existing campus as it exists today. This uh, proposal would include uh, parking lot expansion, the building expansion, uh, additional access onto 83rd Avenue and landscaping improvements to the entirety of the site. This is a look at the conceptual elevations for the site. The current uh, and uh, existing, I should state, general plan land use designation for the site is low density residential. There is no change proposed this evening. This is only the rezoning request. The proposed zoning district of SR43 is aligned with this designation and advances the policies and goals of the general plan. The zoning map on the right hand side of this screen is a mix of zoning districts. Our Zoning districts are uh, stated SR43, which is the current campus, and I-1 across the street. Uh, more broadly, around the area from the unincorporated Maricopa County and Glendale uh, resident, uh, zoning districts are residential and large lot in nature. So this proposal of the city's SR43 is aligned with the surrounding areas, in this case, regardless of political subdivision. In accordance with a public hearing, we sent out a notice of application, notice of hearing postcards, and a site posting. We had the meeting at, at the adjacent church site on May 2nd. Only one member of public attended that meeting. He was a church staff member. Uh, to date, and I can safely say that we have received no uh, formal support or opposition uh, to this request. For our findings, uh, there. are uh, light and straightforward for this uh, sort of rezoning request. It is consistent with the general plan land use designation of low density residential. Please keep in mind there is no residential component to this proposal. This would be just an expansion of the church site. And again, as earlier stated, uh, this is consistent with the zoning and development patterns in the general vicinity, which includes some Peoria, a little bit of Maricopa County, and a little bit of Glendale. Our request for you this evening on item 4R, Z1807, is a recommendation of approval of this case to City Council subject to the conditions outlined in our new Exhibit 1 of our updated staff report. Uh, with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you for your report. Uh, any commissioners have any questions of staff? 
<laughs> it's just the way it worked out today. All right, I'm going to open the public hearing. I do not see the applicant. We have no speaker request forms. I'm going to close the public hearing. All right, any further questions or comments from commissioners before we take action on case 018-07? Uh, Commissioner Nelson, that was uh, Z18-07. Oh, I'm so sorry. Z8, thank you for that. Uh, any further questions or comments for commissioners before we take action on case Z18-07? Do I have a motion? Mr. Chairman, I motion that we approve item 4 Z18-07 to City Council. Thank you, Commissioner Alsop. Do I have a second? No second. Thank you, Commissioner Lewski. We have a motion and a second. Please vote. And the motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Commissioners. Next item on the agenda is call to the public. Uh, I will assume there are no. I don't see anybody in the audience, so we'll move on to updates from staff. Does staff have anything to report tonight? Indeed, I have the pleasure this evening uh, to provide a couple of updates. Um, first and foremost, we have a new uh, staff report uh, format, as you've seen. So if you like it, if you don't, uh, let us know on that one. Um, so going forward, the general plans and the zoning cases, you're going to see the biggest change. They are going to be the one item. It is combined. So if you have any um, questions or thoughts you'd like to share with us on the new format, please let us know. Uh, the second point uh, this evening is something near and dear to my heart. I'm back before you to talk about the general plan. Uh, staff recently uh, sent out uh, to the commissioners, to city council, and more, sorry, but more importantly, our 60-day uh, review cycle to the adjacent agencies. They're, they're the biggest group in the bunch. Um, we have three amendments, as we talked about uh, previous meeting, and I just wanted to kind of re reiterate what was in the email, what's available online, and what's in the packet. So the three uh, amendments that we have, the first one is the circulation map. You'll see uh, when you download the packet, the first map in there kind of shows and highlights every uh, change of where it occurred. The second one is kind of the final draft, if you will, that we're proposing forward. Uh, and these included approximately 38 changes overall. So that's why you see kind of the highlighted um, on the map kind of in pink if you open up that att attachment. The second one is uh, the, for the land use uh, map update. And as we talked about before, this was a, a labor of love, um, 250 square miles, uh, go back in, recognize existing conditions. So the first map, again, what you see uh, is kind of big and blank, and you see some colored areas. That shows the areas that we actually changed. So you'll see the changes. The next map is our final draft in there as, as to what we are proposing for land uses. The third one is a little bit of a cleanup effort. It's a two-part. We have uh, changes, text changes to Chapter 2, the land use element, and Chapter 14, the plan administration. So chapter two, um, along with those cleanups in the land use map, we now recognize the category of water. So we're, we're giving it its own category. We've recognized it on the map. We're putting it, um, it was formerly in the park and open space area. So water is designated uh, in there and that's to better reflect um, conditions uh, such as lakes, canals, uh, our bodies of water that we typically have. The other one is uh, we're working through some uh, what constitutes a, a major and a minor amendment for uh, a general plan. And so you'll see some modifications in that area. So again, all three of these are primarily before, uh, before everybody for consideration because they are cleanup. This is in preparation for next year's cycle when we do the comprehensive update. So uh, we had kind of a significant undertaking just to get ready to do that, that update, if you will. Um, so that's in the, in the packet. So, uh, officially it went out August 9th uh, in the email. We take comments from everybody, including it's available to the public if they wish to comment as well. We can take those up until October 8th. 
then we take a look at those comments, and if we need to make adjustments, we will, and then we'll walk through um, what adjustments we would make. So we have until October 8th. Because of that, um, we're going to be moving the, the planning and zoning dates, and I'll get to that in a minute. But the packet's available on our website at the location on the screen. We also have a hard copy available at our planning counter and at the two libraries if somebody wants to, to look at it that way. <clears throat> we have two open house uh, meeting dates. So first one's gonna be up and coming August 28th. That'll be at the city um, from 6.30 at the Development and Community Services Building. Uh, we'll be walking through those maps, essentially. So if there's questions that people have, we can kind of uh, go in, in terms of walking through the changes and why those occurred. The next uh, meeting is August 29th, the next day. That's up at Cibola Vista Resort. And uh, it's at the Trailhead Building, which is kind of directly across the street from the check-in area. <clears throat> same format, same information presented. It'll be open house if we receive um, people. We'll just walk through if they have any questions. Um, I have my contact information up there uh, for our viewing public. And if you uh, wanted to reach out and send my comments, um, send them to directly to me. And so we'll be compiling those comments again up until October 8th, and then we'll uh, finalize the plan, if you will. So because of, of that, we've got a new tentative public hearing schedule I wanted to, to make uh, commission aware of. The first one is, the first meeting is November 1st, 2018. That's gonna be our remote uh, commission meeting that will be at Rio Vista. Second uh, meeting, which we would be uh, asking for commission to take action would be November 15th. So first one, remote is always for discussion only. No action is taken. The second one, we do ask um, commission for a recommendation. This will still be going to December 4th, 2018 to city council. That is our goal. So let, us, let me know if you have any um, questions or comments on the map uh, or map changes or text changes and uh, just send them directly to me and we can go ahead and and uh, collect and, and respond accordingly. The information uh, along with on the city's website, we're going back to our Plan Peoria AZ and getting that updated as well with the open house information and with the packet uh, as well. So we're trying to do multiple outlets uh, and, and get the word out. So last update I have for you this evening is next meetings. Um, September 6th is canceled. We don't have anything on the agenda, but we do expect to have uh, a September 20th meeting right now. And with that, let me know if you have uh, any questions. Very good, thank you very much. All right, next is reports and updates from the Planning and Zoning Commission. Do any commissioners have anything to report? All right, seeing, so, seeing no further business, I call this meeting adjourned. Ever dreamt of being on stage as a performer or be recognized as an artist or filmmaker? Dreams of being in the spotlight are coming to reality for students of the Maricopa Community Colleges. The top performing and visual artists are being awarded and celebrated here at the Herberger Theater. Welcome to Spirit of the Arts. I'm Andrea Zakszewski. Maricopa students are honored at the annual Artists of Promise Talent Showcase. The Maricopa Community College's Chancellor Award winners feature performances from students in the visual arts, choreography, creative writing, theater, music, and film. The students have an opportunity to display their skills at the Herberger Theater, a top performance venue in downtown Phoenix where some of the top artists perform. The award for the art form of music composition goes to Alejandro Pernod. I got into music back in high school uh, in my soft, sophomore year. I started playing guitar in like punk rock bands. Alejandro describes how it felt when he found out he won for Artists of Promise. It literally felt incredible from a step up. As I said, I came from a punk rock background and like in three years I was able to win a competition. The 
The piece he composed is called Destitute of Perception Becoming Clarity, which is about moments in life of joy and sadness. You leave me these little notes on my pillow. The first place winner for female theater actor goes to Cedar Cody Eileen. Her love of performance goes back to just two years old. Cedar tells us what surprises her most about acting. You have to pull from everyday experiences and things that you've felt yourself, and it's very hard to detach yourself from that while still feeling the emotion and being realistic and believable. Cedar attributes her success to the theater program at Mesa Community College. The theater department there is incredible. They have so many opportunities. Even if you've never designed anything before, you can get on a main stage performance and actually get to design. It's really cool that they let you have the opportunity to try everything. Cedar plans to continue pursuing her degree and possibly open her own theater someday. Everything you do irritates me. The award for solo instrumental flute goes to Lily Andrioli. I've played other instruments, but I do prefer playing the flute because it's it's just a gorgeous instrument, you know, like you, there's many genres you can play on it. When I really get in the zone, it's I'm able to, you know, communicate through my instrument and you know, it's just Playing is an interesting experience because, you know, depending on the piece, like sometimes you can have an extreme emotional connection to a piece. The selection she's playing is called Syrinx by Claude Debussy, which is about a water nymph named Syrinx. The Greek god Pan falls in love with her and pursues her and she doesn't return the feelings. Lily has been happy with the program at Glendale Community College. It's a really well put together program for music and I've bloomed, really, since I came there um, in high school. I'm a completely different musician. The award for media arts were given to students in categories such as documentary and animation. The winners of the visual arts were on exhibition in the lobby of the Herberger. Five of the pieces will be selected to go on to a national exhibition. Categories on display include ceramics, oil paintings, and photography. Instruction through the community colleges helped to elevate art to a whole new level. May these students' work continue to inspire current and future artists. Classes in the performing and visual arts are offered for all skill levels, for beginner, intermediate, and advanced level. Make your dreams a reality by attending classes in the Maricopa Community Colleges for superb instruction at an affordable price. If you're
The Mayor and City Council welcome you to the Peoria City Council meeting. As a courtesy to others, please silence all phones. If you would like to address an issue that is on the agenda, or if you would like to speak to the Council regarding a non-agenda item, please complete a speaker request form, which can be found in the front lobby of the Peoria City Council Chambers or in the tray to the left of the speaker's podium. Please place the completed speaker request form in the second tray to the left of the speaker's podium labeled Request to Speak. All speakers will have three minutes to complete their comments. A countdown clock is easily visible on the left side of the wall behind the City Council dais. Only items listed on the agenda may be addressed by the Council. Since items presented as part of a speaker's request have not been listed on the agenda and due to the requirements of open meeting laws, the Council will be unable to respond to items presented as part of the speaker's request. However, please be aware that your comments will be noted. The speaker's name will be called to speak at the appropriate time in the order that the forms were received. Thank you for your interest and participation in the Peoria City Council meeting. Peoria City Council meeting will now come to order. Please rise for a moment of quiet reflection and the Pledge of Allegiance led by Council Member Binsbacher. Thank you. The clerk will please call the roll. Mayor Carlett. Here. Vice Mayor Finn. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Hunt. Here. Councilmember Patena. Here. Councilmember Vince Bacher. Here. Councilmember Edwards. Here. Councilmember Leone. Here. Council Liaison Johnson. Here. Council Liaison Gilbertson. Here. Good evening and welcome to the Peoria City Council meeting of September 4th, 2018. It is a pleasure to have all of you here with us today. Thank you. I do. Thank you. Uh, before we hand out these awards, I always um, like to take a moment to thank all of the volunteers that uh, help us out here in the city. We have over 100 volunteers that help us on uh, more than 20 different committees, and we would not be able to do what we do on a daily basis without uh, that assistance. So I always like to take an opportunity to thank them for their, um, for their dedication and dedica or volunteering their time to help out the city. So thank you all for all that you do for us. So the first one here is Adam Hawkins, the Design Review Board. Thank you. Next is Jerry Johnson, Parks and Recreation Board. I know, we get him to volunteer for everything, I know. Next is Heath Hershey for Public Defender Contract Review Committee. Everybody stands by you. Thank you.
Okay, September is National Library Card Month, and I'm gonna turn it over to City Manager Jeff Tyne to introduce the next presentation on the incredible library card. Thank you, Mayor and Council, appreciate that. And as the Mayor had mentioned, September is indeed National Library Card Month, and with the help of the Friends of Peoria Public Library, we are promoting the value and importance of our library programs and services and prompting everyone to indeed get their card. And so with that, I wanted to introduce our library services manager, uh, Nathaniel Mashburn. Thank you, Mr. Tyne. Mayor and Council, thanks so much for having us this evening. September is an exciting month for us at the library. It is National Get a Library Card Month. And we have partnered with our wonderful friends group to talk to, to you this evening about the importance of a library card and what a library card can do for you. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Diane Jordan, who's the president of the Friends Group. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Diane Jordan, and I am the president of the Friends of the Peoria Public Library. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to our community tonight. As you know, oops, sorry. As you know, the Friends of 5013C nonprofit works in direct support of our libraries and literacy in our city. Some quick facts. In 2017 alone, the Friends donated over $65,000 to our libraries. And this past summer, the Friends sponsored, funded, and ran 29 free programs for over 3,600 attendees. And in less than two years, 2020, we look forward to celebrating the 100th anniversary of our Peoria libraries. But the reason I'm here today is to promote National Get a Library Card Month. The Friends are joining with the American Libraries Association, libraries nationwide, and the Peoria City Libraries to encourage all residents to sign up for a free library card. Our goal is to make sure every Peoria resident is aware of the value and resources available to each adult and child who have their very own library card. This year, Disney's The Incredibles are the honorary chairs, helping to promote the incredible value of library card ownership. As of July 31st, there are 49,150 active library card users in our Peoria libraries. There are so many new residents moving into our city. The friends are excited to reach out and encourage these new and current Peorians to look to unlock the incredible value of a local library card. You might be familiar with many of the benefits of library card ownership, from book and media borrowing to ebook usage, programs, classes, and so much more. Our libraries of today are not the libraries you remember from your childhood. They've evolved to centers of continuing education and learning. So now we ask, do you have a library card? If you don't, it takes less than 10 minutes to stop by and get a card. Just give your branch a call for more information. If you are an existing cardholder, please tell your friends and neighbors. Get them to the library. And if you get a library card in September, you will also receive a special surprise. In closing, I would like to take the time to thank our incredible sponsors listed here, especially Council Member John Edwards and Mayor Pro Tem Vicki Hunt who have been great supporters of our STEAM programs and sponsoring t-shirts at our book sale. Thank you to both of you. We are also grateful for our incredible community sponsors, which keep our friends' programs free. And, and to our force, so please go to your Peoria Public Library for a free library card today. And to our Spanish friends, vaya a su biblioteca pública de Peoria para una gratis tarjeta de biblioteca. Thank you. And once again, thank you uh, for giving us this opportunity. Having a library card and supporting your local library is extremely important. We couldn't do what we do without our amazing friends group. Mm -hmm. So I just want to take a minute to thank them for the incredible work that they do in our communities with programming. Uh, the, the wonderful things that they provide to all of, of our community is quite amazing. So I'd like to take a minute to say thank you, thank you. to you and your crew over there. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.
Once again, thank you for the time this evening. And if you don't have a library card, make sure you get over to Peoria, Maine, or to the Sunrise Branch and get yourself a library card. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we will now move on to the consent agenda. All items listed on the consent agenda are considered to be routine or have been previously reviewed by the City Council and will be enacted by one motion unless a council member requests an item to be removed and considered in the normal sequence of the agenda. Tonight's consent agenda also includes items that require public hearing, so if there's any member of the public who would like to uh, request that an item from consent be approved, be removed from the consent agenda and heard on the regular agenda, please fill out a form in the bin next to the podium. I have none of those speaker request forms. Councilor, are there any items to be removed from consent? Seeing none, do I have a motion? I'll motion. Second. I have a motion and second. Please vote. And the consent agenda passes unanimously. We will now move on to the regular agenda, and the first item is Council Confirmation of Police Chief Appointment, and I will turn it over to Mr. Stein for that. Great. Thank you, Mayor and Council. And with the departure of Chief Minter, the city undertook a national search for our next police chief, and after an initial review of 55 applications and through what is safe to say an extensive interview process, we are proud to bring forward to you for your consideration Arthur Miller as our candidate for Peoria's next police chief. Just a little background, Chief Miller brings an extensive law enforcement background that includes 20 years of experience in upper level management, most recently as police chief for the city of South Pasadena, California. In fact, we are fortunate to have representatives from the city of South Pasadena, including officers uh, here to, to witness this. Uh, before that, Art served in important leadership positions with the Los Angeles Police Department as well. Arthur is a graduate of the FBI National Academy, the U.S. Army West Point Leadership Program. In addition, his education, uh, undergraduate degree in business administration and a master's degree in organizational leadership. But probably most important to all of us, we are extremely impressed with Art's personal approach to all issues, really showing a penchant for uh, his leadership style. It's really a servant leadership style that he brought forward and proving indeed that he's been a pillar in the communities that he's been in the past. And to that end, I am happy to recommend to the council Arthur Miller as Peoria's next police chief. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Tyne. Council, are there any questions, comments? Seeing none, do I have a motion? A motion. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. And that is to appoint um, our next police chief in the city of Peoria. Council, please vote. And it passes unanimously. to the official swearing in of the new Peoria Police Chief by Presiding Municipal Judge George Anagnost. And Chief Miller, I'd like to invite you to the front and your wife, Linda.
I do want to say a few words, and I'll make my comments brief. Um, first of all, I want to thank the uh, city uh, personnel that helped me get through this process. It's been, um, I actually can't believe this moment has arrived. It's been a long, <laughs> it's been a long journey. Uh, but I want to take the time to thank uh, uh, Laura Ingenieri, um, Didi Gates, and I don't see Brock here. Uh, I, I invited him here, Brock Jacobo, who uh, was kind of my shepherd through most of the process. Uh, at the, with the leadership of uh, Laura and Didi. Um, this process began uh, back in May. Uh, the first interview was uh, July 17th, and uh, I can confidently say that uh, I've taken about 30 interviews to get to this point here today. So uh, I get the seriousness of, of this position. Uh, I have two messages. One is to the men and women of the police department. Um, first of all, I want to get an opportunity to get a, a chance to know you all. Uh, but more importantly, I want to get, you to have a chance to get to know me, my family, uh, Linda and Rick, my, our son Rick. Uh, I have a commitment to you, uh, and then on a, on a slightly higher level, I have a commitment to our profession to serve our public to the best way that we can, uh, keeping the Constitution in mind as we, as we do our policing. I am very uh, motivated by community, uh, uh, community outreach, and I will continue that. Uh, there's been a, a strong uh, push for community uh, outreach in, in Peoria is something that I, uh, I'm familiar with in my prior assignments and my prior departments. Uh, to the community in, in, as a whole, I have some friends here uh, from Peoria, uh, from, our, from our neighborhood. Uh, I have some relatives here. My brother Richard, my brother Rudy uh, is here. Um, I have um, friends from California that are here, friends that I've known for uh, over 25 years. Uh, Pat Finley, front row over here. We were partners way back when. A uh, long, long time ago, and it's quite an honor to see the uh, progression, if you will, of life and a career. And Pat certainly plays a huge role in that. Um, to my uh, former uh, partners in South Pasadena, it means so much to me that you're here today. Uh, I think it makes a statement to uh, what we did in South Pasadena, and just know that any successes that we had there was through your efforts, and it's through those efforts that I want to continue here in uh, in Peoria. And uh, to the council, know this, that uh, we will continue to be a very responsive uh, police department. And uh, being public servants and being the head of the department, uh, I want you to know that I'll be the head servant when things are uh, get, needed to get done. And I, I commit to you as the representatives of our community and being a community member myself, I know how important that is. Um, so anyway, thank you all for being here. Thank you for sharing this very important moment with me. And uh, I'm looking forward to the future. Thank you so much. We'll now take a short recess and convene in 15 minutes.
Peoria City Council meeting will once again come to order. Will the clerk please call the roll? Mayor Carlin. Here. Vice Mayor Finn. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Hunt. Here. Council Member Patena. Here. Council Member Binsbacher. Here. Council Member Edwards. Here. Council Member Leone. Here. Council Liaison Johnson. Here. Council Liaison Gilbertson. Here. Thank you. Uh, we will now continue with our regular agenda, beginning with two public hearings, which we will hear together and then uh, vote on individually. This is 23R, Minor General Plan Amendment, Via Lago, Lake Pleasant Road, and Beardsley Road, as well as the rezoning for the same property. And I will turn it over to um, Mr. Tyne. Great, thank you, Mayor. And Chris Hawkins, our planning director, will provide the presentation for these two items. Thank you. Okay, good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, items 23 and 24R, they both pertain to requests filed for a minor general plan amendment and a rezone uh, for an 11 acre site that's uh, located west of the northwest corner of Lake Pleasant Road or 99th Avenue and Beardsley Road. Uh, the requests were filed by the applicant, uh, the uh, law firm of Birch and Cracciolo on behalf of Next, uh, Next Metro Development. So if approved, the request would facilitate the construction of a 120 unit multifamily residential community to be called a Via Lago. So there are two requests this evening. Uh, item 23R, this is a minor general plan amendment that relates to the 11 acre property. Uh, it's a request to amend the land use designation from low density residential, two to five units per acre, to a designation of medium high density residential or eight to 15 units per acre. And then the companion case is a rezoning, 24R, which seeks to change the zoning from intermediate commercial, or C2, uh, to a residential planned area development. Mayor and Council, now I'll, I'll discuss the, uh, the site and area context. Again, the site is uh, denoted in red on the screen. Again, it's west of the northwest corner of Lake Pleasant Road and, and Beardsley Road. Um, it's, again, about 11 acres in size. It's about three quarters of a mile from the Lake Pleasant Parkway and Lake Pleasant Road intersection, as you can see on the screen there. Um, more specifically, in the area, uh, the site is located south uh, and uh, to the east of the Ventana Lakes community. Um, one home on the western side of the site in Ventana Lakes uh, butts the property. The homes in Ventana Lakes are one story, just to note that. Uh, to the east is a commercial area. At the hard corner at the intersection is a Walgreens. To the north of that are um, a mix of ur urgent care and some professional office complexes. Uh, directly across the street from Lake Pleasant Road is a commercial center anchored by a Bash's uh, a grocery store. Uh, to the south, unincorporated part of the county um, of Sun City. And then to the west, the uh, extra space storage which occupies most of the frontage along the, that abuts the property. And then as I indicated, Ventana Lakes to the west. A little bit about the site here. It's a, it's a vacant, irregular shaped infill site. It's been zoned commercial since 1986. And uh, staff, as we looked at this case, we, we um, noted in our analysis that we don't believe this is a great commercial site. Uh, it lacks uh, the visibility and the access that's afforded by the hard corner, the intersection of Beards and Lake Pleasant Road. Not only that, it has very narrow frontage along Beardsley Road, so you would imagine that uh, all the commercial users on the site um, have uh, little visibility uh, from Beardsley Road. And so it's not a great commercial site, and hence the reason it's probably remained uh, vacant uh, since 1986, the zoning case there. It does have some, uh, some uh, uh, features on the site, including a 30-foot regional drainage easement that provides drainage solutions to not only Ventana Lakes to the north, but exist along the eastern 30 feet of the site. It's denoted in green. And then at the northwest corner of the site, there is a existing utility and uh, access easement that, uh, and sewer line easement that provides uh, uh, joint access between the site and uh, Ventana Lake. So we'll talk about that part of it when I get into the development proposal. So we illustrate on the screen, this is the conceptual development plan. And let me just orientate you, if you look at the left side of the screen, that's Beardsley, it's just a really long site. And on the right side of the screen is the north part. So the north is to the right, south is to the left. Um, this is a 120 unit multifamily community. It's what they call uh, a casita style or bungalows, you've probably heard that too. But these consist uh, solely of one story units. The units are approximately 16 feet in height. 
the size of the units range from 625 square feet to uh, 1,250 on the larger units. They're a mix of one, two, and three bedroom units. In fact, about a third are within each category of, of uh, unit type. Um, the uh, the uh, development proposal will uh, integrate three distinct color material palettes that will be distributed throughout the site. Um, also along with the proposal is uh, 40 garage units, garage space I should say. If you look at the screen, you might see some brown boxes in the middle. Those are where the garage spaces are, the covered garage spaces. And then your uh, covered spaces are denoted in gray. And then the balance of the parking spaces are guest and open parking spaces there. The, uh, there are two amenity areas in the project. There's one at the southern end of the project that I'll, I'll show you a little more detail in a second, and one on the northern end of the project. Uh, in terms of access, as with any rezone case, we do require a preliminary traffic impact statement. Uh, this was prepared by a professional engineer and reviewed by our traffic engineering staff. And what they do is they look at the uh, trip generation that's proposed, they look at the, the capacity of the adjacent roadway and the level of service. And what they've determined is that the site and the existing facilities will function uh, adequately with uh, one access point at Beardsley Road. They are recommending some uh, moderate changes to the median. Uh, those moderate changes would include um, so it would be full access, it would include an um, elongated uh, acceleration lane going left out, outbound, or eastbound from the site, but an elongated acceleration lane. And also, um, as inbound traffic, as we're coming into the development, are going eastbound, um, more storage room to accommodate those left turn into the development. Um, I'll show you that. Okay, so this is the southern amenity area. This is the largest amenity area. It's anchored by a pool and a spa area. You can see on the screen the different amenities that are part of that area. The putting green, the barbecue grill, fire pit, uh, bag toss, and a turf area. So that's at the southern extent of it, uh, adjacent to where the le leasing office would be as you enter the development there. And then the amenity area to the north. Uh, this is a large turf area, but also includes a uh, fenced dog park as part of this uh, development dog wash, and uh, shaded seating areas as well. So I'm going to show you a few elevations. And just note that when we go through site plan review, we'll look at all the colored material palettes and uh, ensure that we have the right product diversity throughout the site. But uh, this will show, just kind of give you a, an idea of the feel for it. So most of the units are single unit buildings. About 68% of them are. And then about 32% are duplex, where so you have two units as part of a building. But most are single unit buildings. Mm -hmm just to give you an idea of the flavor of, of what this development buildings would look like. Uh, this is the leasing office and the, and the garage elevation as you enter the site. I mentioned the garage elevations where you have 40 of those spaces, so this is what the uh, garage elevations would look like. And then this is some of the entry detail, the main entry into the site, and then some of the wall detail around it, just to kind of give you an idea of what, uh, what the character is intended to be. Okay, so as we look at it, this uh, graphic on the screen, this is the current general plan designation. Uh, so this identifies the uh, land use designation for the area, and the general plan, of course, indicates what is sought or aspired for the area. So the general plan designation for this property is low density residential, two to five units per acre. Uh, this is typified by detached single family, more of a suburban character. Lot sizes range from 8,000 up to 12,000, so that suburban character there. Um, you will, but one thing to note as you look at the screen is that it doesn't really match conditions on the ground. And what I mean by that is, you know, it looks like this, uh, this property is kind of floating in a larger sea of low density residential. That's not really the case. You've got commercial to the east on both sides of Lake Pleasant Road flanking that uh, roadway, uh, mini storage to the west. And truth be told, the Ventana Lakes community is probably a higher density than what this uh, indicates. And the reason I mentioned that is, is we're going through a, a general plan update this year as part of this year's cycle, and we're looking to introduce a little more, uh, a little more uh, specificity to the general plan and reflect better what the underground conditions are. So it shouldn't appear as if it's just floating in the middle of, of a low-density residential. In fact, it's not. Um, the proposal tonight is to redesignate the site to a medium high density residential, 8 to 15 units per acre. Uh, they're proposing 10 units, about 10.8 units per acre. Typically, when we look at multifamily or multi story multifamily in a suburban area, you're looking at 20 to 24 units per acre. So, this is more of a, uh, a lower density multifamily product. 
Um, this is a category that uh, is uh, purposed for infill and transitional sites, sites that are near services and employment opportunities. So it includes not only attached single family, but also uh, multifamily of the lower density type. Mayor and Council, this is the uh, current zoning for the site, again, uh, denoted in red. Um, it's zoned intermediate commercial. It's been zoned that way since 1986. The C2 zoning category is our most uh, common commercial zoning district in the city, and it allows everything from uh, retail services, uh, uh, fast food restaurants, gas stations, and the like. So it allows uh, quite a range of commercial services. Um, in, the, in the area, the, in terms of the zoning, uh, to the north, uh, Ventana Lakes is actually zoned multifamily residential. There was a time when, when we allowed uh, single family as part of the multifamily category. Not the case today, but back in the day, that's what we allowed. Um, to the east, it, as you would expect, are some commercial zoning uh, with office, with the office complex to the east, and then C2 commercial at the hard corner. Uh, to the south, again, is Sun City uh, in the county. And then west, again, the continuation of that multifamily residential as part of Ventana Lakes. So when we looked at the case, our, our analysis was this, is that, um, you, know, you know, we talked about the, the commercial site and how the, the staff analysis was that it wasn't a great commercial site. Uh, we believe the general plan with its residential designation recognizes that it's not a good commercial site um, for all those reasons. It lacks the visibility and the access that's afforded at the corner the irregular shape and limited frontage along the roadway, and uh, we already have a number of commercial services that are at that corner. So it's, it's, in our view, it's not a good commercial site. We think the general plan recognizes that and believes that the residential disposition is the right land use. Um, so it has a residential designation on this property. The applicant is still pursuing a residential designation, albeit the higher density residential uh, designation. We believe with this adjustment that this will provide a good transition. With the one-story limitation, the, the moderate density, it'll, it'll, be a good, uh, it'll provide good compatibility with the area um, and, and be a good fit for, for the property. With all rezone cases and general plan cases, they go through a public hearing process. Uh, we provide a notification and when the application comes in. It's called a notice of application. Uh, we have a neighborhood meeting and we also provide notification when it's ready to go to hearing though that, based on the size of the site. That was uh, sent to all owners within a 600-foot radius and all registered HOAs within one mile. Uh, there was a neighborhood meeting held. It was held on March uh, 29th, uh, 2018 at the Ventana Lakes Yacht Club. There was a very large at attendance there. We had 75 members in attendance there uh, along with, the, uh, with uh, Councilmember Binsbacher and staff. The topics that were discussed there, there was concerns about access to Ventana Lakes community. If you recall that Northwest uh, access easement, there was concerns about whether that someday will become uh, vehicular access. And so what I can report to you is that there is a stipulation here that limits it to emergency access only. So if there was ever a desire in the future to come back and modify that, they would have to come back through a public hearing process and back before the council. So that is emergency access only. There was also uh, concerns or perhaps desire for um, access to the east through the commercial areas. Um, I can point out that the uh, applicant on two occasions approached the property owners to the east to see if there was the possibility of pedestrian access, and unfortunately, uh, the, the commercial uh, interest weren't, uh, they weren't interested in that access point. I will note, though, that as people think about getting to the commercial areas on the east side, they have to uh, walk anyway to the corner, which is where the safe crossing is. So whether they're walking east or walking south, they have to end up at the, at the uh, corner where the signalization is. There were also uh, concerns about, uh, whether, about the density, and as I noted earlier, um, this is very different than the typical multifamily or higher you know, level multifamily that we typically see in the valley around the 22 or 24 units per acre. This is 10 units per acre. And then there was also concerns about, um, particularly in the northern end of the development, if lights, if there will be um, uh, trespass of lights onto those adjacent properties. I'll note that the overhead poles, they're going to be limited to 16 feet in height, which is the residential standard. They're going to be fully shielded to prevent glare and any light trespass. And then it, as we see the site plan come in, we, we ask for what's called a photometric study. And that's just for us to, de, to determine and, and to ensure that there is, in fact, no light trespass uh, past the property line. So we'll, we'll see that with the site plan review. Um, and through the uh, context of the application, we did receive two letters of support and two letters of opposition. Uh, in terms of the letter of support, we uh, received feedback that the uh, respondents liked the product type and they believed that the demographic mix uh, was good, uh, something that perhaps wasn't uh, currently in the area, and they liked the elevations that were presented uh, to, the, to the site. Those in opposition um, 
had concerns again with, with traffic. Um, I'll note that with the current commercial zoning, arguably you would have a higher traffic generation than you would with, with a multifamily project here. Uh, there was also, um, uh, we also received uh, late last week a supplementary email from the uh, Peoria Unified School District. We've, we've passed that out for your review. Um, this email supplements earlier correspondence that we got from the district. And what this latest email identifies is that uh, school capacity challenges that are in the area and then points to the forthcoming bond election uh, that's intended to address uh, those issues. This item went to a public hearing in front of the Planning and Zoning Commission. Uh, there was one speaker from Ventana Lakes and just reiterated the concern that we heard earlier about limiting that uh, vehicle, about that access at 103rd Avenue to uh, emergency access only. And as, I, as I reported, it is a stipulation. Um, after deliberation, the commission voted five to zero to recommend approval of both cases as presented. So our key findings for the applications with respect to the minor general plan amendment, Again, as I noted, the uh, general plan recognizes that the residential designation on the property is appropriate. We believe the change still uh, acknowledges that residential designation provides a more compatible transition given the context in the area and reflects the needs in, in the area. And as far as the rezone is concerned, uh, it would conform to the proposed medium high density designation at 10 units per acre, and it facilitates a new housing type that uh, will offer additional choice to the area. So Mayor and Council, with that, uh, there are two recommendations this evening. The minor general plan amendment, uh, the recommendation is to concur with the Planning and Zoning Commission and adopt a resolution to redesignate 11 acres from low density residential to medium high density residential. And then the companion case, 24R, a rezone, concur with the Planning and Zoning Commission and adopt an ordinance to rezone approximately 11 acres from intermediate commercial to planned area development, and that's subject to conditions one through seven in your packet. And with that, I'll answer any questions. Thank you. Councilor, are there any questions for Mr. Hawkus? Mm -hmm. Councilmember Edwards. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Chris, can you, um, I know this is fairly new product type uh, here to the city of Peoria. Can you kind of, what type of design considerations uh, did you work with with the developer uh, to make this a better project? Mayor, Councilmember Edwards, excellent question. You're absolutely right. Uh, this is a product type that we first saw come out of the ground at 83rd and Olive. And uh, uh, based on that outcome, there was a few things we learned, and we've had a lot of pressure for this, this product type, quite frankly, throughout the city, and we see it throughout the valley, too. So th some things that came to mind is uh, that we, when, in dealing with that uh, issue, is that it's important to have good product diversity and to have um, uh, color material palettes that are distributed throughout the development so it, doesn't, so it appears like we've got uh, distinction in the development. So there, as I noted, there are three distinct color material palettes. The other thing we noticed too was some of those uh, units that were abutting uh, perimeter walls seem to be had that canyon effect, a little little tight end. So we've uh, worked with the developer in trying to have expanded rear yards, particularly on perimeter units. So you'll see in this development uh, yards between eight and 12 feet in, in uh, size. So much larger than, than perhaps we saw at the bungalows down here. Probably the biggest one for us is the screening of the mechanical utility meter packs. And so with this development and working with, with the developer, um, they will be introducing uh, metal screening that will cover the meters and also be painted to match the color of the buildings. So that's a big one for us. And, and then finally, I think it's always important in these developments to have ample guest parking. So not only do they meet the requirements, but it's also important to ensure that the guest parking is um, properly distributed throughout the site. Because if it's not properly distributed, then it doesn't really matter how much you have. So it's important that that take place. And so we've worked with the developer and, and trying to make sure that that's there. And I also want to recognize the fact that, you know, we have some members of the Ventana Lakes uh, uh, Association here. We have their board president and the liaison uh, to the city council. And I know I've met with Marilyn McCord on numerous occasions and uh, have worked diligently with her and you, Chris, and, um, and the developer as well uh, to really address the concerns that the community had. And I think that uh, all of you guys have done a really good job of addressing those concerns. So I want to thank kudos to everybody. But I have a couple questions of the applicants, and so can we ask questions of that applicant now, or is um, it, or do you want to wait? During the public hearing, he's okay. going to come up, you got it. so can wait on so I'll, I'll for a hold, minute. hold the rest of my questions. Thank you. Council Member Patena. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> Chris, I'm not sure whether you can answer this question or not, but in one of your letters of opposition, uh, they feared that, uh, or they were perceiving this as potentially being low-income housing. Any thoughts on that at all? Mayor, Councilmember Patena, um, 
this is probably a, a more appropriate question for the applicant. What I can tell you is that my understanding, these are market rate units. These are not subsidized units. So these will be, uh, they can probably give you a better idea of what the, what the um, range will be in terms of the leasing, uh, monthly leasing price, but it's, these are market rate units. Thanks. All right. Um, I will now declare this public hearing open. If there's anyone who would like to address this issue from the audience, um, please fill out a speaker request form and put it in the bin near the podium. And I do have a speaker request form from Brennan Ray. If you will please approach the podium and give your name and address for the record. Uh, good evening, mayors, members of council. Uh, Brennan Ray, 702 East Osborne, here on behalf of the applicant, Next Metro Communities. Um, first and foremost, uh, let me just say that we are very excited uh, to be here presenting this case tonight. Uh, we believe it represents a high quality uh, development that is going to provide a sustainable and viable solution on this challenging infill site. Um, Next Metro, briefly, is an Arizona-based company that has multiple developments that they've constructed uh, and are under construction, not only in the Valley, but throughout the U.S. as well. Um, as, as Chris alluded to and as Councilman Edwards alluded to, we've worked really close as we've gone through this process, uh, worked closely with planning staff, worked closely with traffic engineering, worked closely with the Councilman's office, worked closely with Ventana Lakes. Uh, at every step of the way, we have worked and there has been a lot of work put in by a variety of different people to ensure that this is the type of the development uh, that is appropriate for the area and that the city can be proud of as well in this location. Um, certainly the layout, and I can go into as much detail, it's been designed with our adjacent neighbors in mind. Uh, and I do have a presentation if we needed to run through that, um, but I will um, forbear that unless this council so desires because uh, Chris did a very thorough job on his presentation. Um, we again agree with staff's assessment that this is a challenging site and that this proposed use uh, represents a good transitional use from the more intense commercial uses out on the corner uh, to our uh, east, uh, transitioning to Ventana Lakes. So uh, with that, we're okay with the stipulations in the rezoning. Um, we would certainly request this council's approval in accordance with uh, staff and the Planning Commission's recommendation. Um, if I may, Mayor, I'll, I'd like to respond to Councilman Patina's question. Uh, about the quality of this, and then I believe Councilman Edwards, if that's all right, has a couple of questions. If there is any way that I can get my presentation up really quickly, there's just one slide that I'd like to have for that. I apologize. Uh, through the mayor, Council, Councilman Patina, this slide and other members of, of council, this slide kind of represents what the Avia brand is. Uh, and as you can see on that slide, it represents a lifestyle choice. Uh, this type of a, of a product is not a, a stop of a place of last resort, i.e. no one has any place else to go. People choose to live in this type of community. As you can see from the, the demographics that we show there, Clearly, we have a much more mature crowd and that a fair number of people are over the age of 35. We have a high number of single women. Um, a good portion of the residents for this type of community come from single family homes. And you can see the range of the household income as well as the amount of kids. It really represents a unique product that is, is a choice and it is, uh, as Chris alluded to, market rate uh, driven in terms of the rental rates. Uh, in terms of what we're seeing. It's a multi-million dollar investment. Um, so I believe that hopefully answers your questions. If there's additional follow-up, I'm more than happy to answer them. Uh, and with that, I'll defer to Councilman Edwards or any other council person. Councilman Edwards. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Brennan. Um, so uh, Chris made a comment uh, about the uh, letter from the school districts uh, the identifying capacity challenges. Can you provide some insight into the developer's decision to bypass the assistance with PUSD? Uh, through the mayor, Councilman Edwards, um, l let me first start off by saying uh, that uh, there was a considerable amount of communication that took place leading up um, even prior to the Planning Commission from our office to PUSD, from PUSD back, and I can go into as much detail as you'd like. 
regarding those communications. But specifically to your question, I believe this slide really perfectly illustrates um, our reason because this, uh, as I've always understood uh, donation agreements with schools, um, they kind of fall into typically two categories, single family homes and your traditional two and three story walk up apartments. Well, this is neither one of those. It's something that falls somewhere in between. As you can tell, again, from that slide, we certainly cater to a more mature crowd where there is a relatively uh, few number of children for, a, you know, for 120. We would estimate that for these 120 residences, there are approximately 24 uh, with a wide variety of ages and ranges and with a wide variety of schooling options that exist today. Thank you. So, Mayor, so I, I have another question, but it's not for the applicant. It's actually for our city attorney. Can I ask that question now? Or yes, go right ahead. Okay, so, Vanessa, um, so learning of this, uh, of this concern, you know, I'd like to see some, going forward, I'd like to see some earnest discussion between developers and the local school districts. And so what can the city develop, what can we develop a process uh, or modify a process that, that basically says that a meeting must take place, whether it's you know, via email or phone conversation or something like that, between the developer and the school district so that when it goes to the P&Z and it comes to city council, we have the full picture of what is going on because um, this is the second case that's come in front of us where this um, has become an issue. And I think it's with infill projects, I think it could become an issue going forward. And I'd, I'd just like to see um, you know, some, some discussion and, and some possible changes to our process. Uh, certainly, Mayor, Councilmember Edwards, uh, taking a more proactive approach with uh, requiring uh, conversations early on in the process between the developer applicant and the school district is probably something that we could work to develop within the city. So I would. Um, I would support that effort and would encourage uh, Chris Hawkins and, and others to work on a plan that would, um, that would put that onus on the applicant to work directly with the school district as the city looks at, at growth and, and impact on the community. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. And back to Brennan. I, I do wholeheartedly support this project moving forward, so I just I had some questions that I just need to get straight in my mind, so thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Councilor, are there any further questions for Mr. Ray? All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And seeing no further comments, I declare this public hearing closed. <coughs> Council, any further discussion? Um, I would like to just comment that, that I really see this as a, a common sense project for this area. It's a great transition from commercial into the residential that is Ventana Lakes. And that property has been vacant for so long. And you know that vacant property has always been a little bit of a fear tactic. Is it going to be a tire store? Is it going to be a Circle K? So I'm glad that it's finally developing into something that's, that's um, workable for the community. So with that, Council, do I have a motion? We will begin with item 23R. This is the minor general plan amendment. A motion. A motion second. and a second. Council, please vote. It passes unanimously. And now item 24R, which is the rezoning. Um, do I have a motion? A motion. Second. Council, please vote. And it passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Next item on our agenda is item 25R. This is a contract, 103rd Avenue, Northern Avenue to Olive okay. Avenue, street improvements. Mr. Tyne. Great, thank you. And we have Adina Lung, our development and engineering director, will present on this project. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I'm here tonight to talk about item 25R, which is the construction contract for 103rd Avenue street improvements. This project is on 103rd Avenue and the extent of the limits is from Northern to Olive. I wanna draw your attention to the pictures that we have that talk about the existing conditions. If you notice the asphalt pavement and the chain link fence, this is not normal wear and tear that we would see in our city. So we had to do some investigation to figure out what was going on. 
This is in the area adjacent to the Glendale landfill. And in order to investigate it, we hired a geotechnical engineer to see what was going on. He examined the historical records and did soil investigation. And you'll never guess what we found. <laughs> the trash actually is outside of the limits of the landfill. So how does this happen? The landfill was from the 1950s. And in the 1950s, you'll never guess, we did not regulate landfills. So <laughs> the Society of Civil Engineers proposed regulations in 1959, which is after this landfill was closed. And the federal government implemented those in the mid-70s. So we are left with this. So what are we going to do about it? We were lucky enough to do the soil investigation, which shows it's non-hazardous material. That means when we excavate it with this project, we can dispose of it in a traditional landfill that is now regulated. So how much debris is this? It's 4,000 cubic yards of debris that we will need to excavate and just deposit in the landfill. At that time, we can bring in clean material and we can place it in the proper methods that we do today. This will be our base for building the new roadway. The next graphic shows our planned improvements. It's broken into two different areas. The first area adjacent to the yellow shows where we will be doing widening. The widening will increase the capacity of the road from one lane in each direction to two lanes in each direction. We will also install a raised landscape median and sidewalks that meet the current ADA requirements. Traditionally, we have looked at all of our projects and the existing utilities. For this project, we have an aged water line. It is made of asbestos concrete pipe. Don't be alarmed with asbestos. We can abandon it in place. We will cap the ends and we will grout it. But we will install a new ductile iron pipe. So that's in the limits of the yellow. We are also going to replace that chain link fence with something a little bit better. That will be a wrought iron fence that is now eight feet high. So besides aesthetics, it will provide better security for the landfill and for the golf course. The area in red that you see that extends to northern, well, we aren't as fortunate to be expanding the roadway. We had negotiations with the vacant property owner, and they were not willing to dedicate the right of way, nor were they willing to take what we thought was a nominal offer. We would build the improvements, we would pay them for their land, and it would increase the value. They were not interested. So in that section, we will be replacing the existing asphalt so that when we walk away, it will be a brand new roadway. We will also update the sidewalks to be ADA compatible. In this section, the water line is already ductile iron pipe, so we don't need to replace it. The plan schedule. If you approve the contract, we will be having our pre-construction meeting next month, and then we'll start construction. It should take about nine months to complete, so we should be finished by the end of summer of 19. With this project, we opted to go with a low bid delivery method because we had done all of the geotechnical investigation. We feel we have a very good set of plans and specifications. We're very clear on the limits of the excavation and the disposal. So with that, we had low bids through materials management, and Nesbitt Contracting Company is the low bidder. The contract is for $3 million, $3 million, $14,561. And that is to construct the improvements on 103rd from Northern to Olive. So I'm asking for you to approve the contract tonight. Do you have any questions? Thank you. Um, I have a question. Um, as the southbound traffic goes from Olive down to Northern and it goes from four lanes into two lanes, are we anticipating um, traffic problems there, or is there capacity? I mean, the is there any capacity, capacity problems? We already have current capacity for all the traffic. We've done the studies that look at the 30 year and the ultimate build out. When the Northern Avenue project comes forward in 2023, we will look at the traffic volumes again, and at that time, we'll assess if we need to widen the other part of the road. Of course, we prefer development pays for itself, and when they come in, they would do the building of the roadway. Fair enough. Thank you. Councilmember Leone? Yeah, on this uh, 
And on Third Avenue, are you going to block off one side, complete that, then go over on the other side until it's all completed? We have not sat down with the winning contractor yet. Um, if you approve the contract tonight, when we have our pre-construction meeting, we will discuss the construction methodology and schedule, and we'll talk about the traffic impacts. Once we have that information, we will have a hotline number and we will distribute flyers to the neighborhood to keep them involved with what the traffic plans will be during construction. Because you get, remember, you get homes all in there. Correct. We are very concerned of getting people safely to and from their homes, so we will look at that. And you're going to put sidewalks in? We are going to put sidewalks in on both sides in the yellow area and replacing the sidewalks in the red area so it will meet ADA requirements. Right now, those are older sidewalks, and in some places, the slopes do not meet the existing standard. And, uh, and landscaping. And landscaping, median, and landscape behind the sidewalks where there's room. The last question I got, when you get down all the way to the end on a certain property, did they donate that to you, or are we going to have to buy it, or what? They did not donate it. They would not agree to the purchase price we offered. So we are not doing any improvements on their land except what is in the existing right of way. Yeah, because I don't think we'd want to buy what, what, what they want for it. They wouldn't even tell us the price during our negotiation, so I'm not sure, but. Okay, thank you. Thank you, any further questions? All right, um, council, do I have a motion on item 25R? So moved. Second. Thank you. Council, please vote. <coughs> and it passes unanimously. Thank you. All right, next item uh, is call to the public on non-agenda items, and I have received no speaker request forms, so we will move on to reports from city manager. Mr. Tyne. Great, thank you, Mayor. Um, just one item also I wanted to bring out quickly with regard to items 23R and 24R, and, and I think Councilmember Edwards' comments were well put uh, to look at all different processes to encourage that kind of discussion between the developer. And um, just as a reminder to the audience, the city of Peoria has a great relationship with the Peoria Unified School District. We have a number of processes in place. They've been great partners. Uh, I think we'll work very closely with our attorneys to really look at different ways that we can encourage conversations. Clearly, we're not able to get involved in financial negotiations between the third party and, and that other government entity, but we're going to do everything we can. So thank you for the, the comments on that, uh, Councilmember Edwards. Uh, before I go on, I think I'd be remiss without announcing another important appointment that we've had here at the city. Uh, for the city council you brought forward, that economic prosperity, our long-term economic development is something that is absolutely critical. Uh, and that means, of course, finding quality jobs to bring here, bring in a diversity of industry, and also making sure that commercial services are available to all of our residents over time. To do that takes uh, a concerted effort. And with that in mind, we have recently hired our new economic development director to help us with these, these ambitious goals. And with that, I'd like to introduce in the audience, we have Rick Buss, our new economic development director. Uh, just a little background, Rick, yeah, you do have to stand. <laughs> yes. Rick, uh, just a little background, his education includes a bachelor's in international marketing, and a master's in public administration, and a master's in sustainability. In addition, he has worked for the cities uh, in leadership positions with the cities of Maricopa, Gila, Brand, Gila Bend, and Surprise, but also has also commercial and private sector experience, uh, including uh, with uh, being the CEO of a technical company uh, or technology company, also being involved with a NASDAQ-related uh, company as well. Uh, he has an outstanding relationship in the community, both with the business community and with government officials throughout the Valley of the Sun. Clearly, yet another servant leader that we have hired here. Uh, he is focused on relationship, very inclusive and collaborative in his approach. So we're very excited to have Rick work for us. Uh, Welcome. Uh, Real quick, uh, just a quick announcement. The city of Peoria had another key milestone that we were proud to bring up with us. Uh, through the Arizona Department of Public Health, there is a program called the Healthy Arizona Work Sites Program. This is a program that recognizes those organizations that are making the most efforts to positively affect 
the health and well-being of their employees and of their families. And we're very fortunate that for the third year in a row, the city of Peoria was recognized, but we have now been recognized at the platinum level, the highest level that you can receive for that. We are one of only three jurisdictions in the entire state uh, to get to that level, uh, along with the cities of Mesa and the city of Yuma, uh, and really recognizes the comprehensive wellness program that we've had here at the city. So an example of that includes efforts that we provide to our employees, such as biometric screenings, health risk assessments, on-site flu vaccinations, uh, celebrations of different health months, skin cancer screenings, heart health screenings, a number of uh, different programs and initiatives that we take throughout the year. And uh, in the audience, of course, we have Laura Engineery, who has been our director. It's really helped us spearhead this, as well as her human resources staff. And we're very proud of the efforts that they put forward on that. And congratulations are in order. Uh, the last item we had, yep. Yeah. <laughs> and then lastly, we did want to show a video of the upcoming events, including an important triathlon and the Somos Peoria event. That's all I have. Thank you. Youth Council Liaison Johnson. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'd like to con congratulate Police Chief Arthur Miller on his new position. Um, I would also like to thank the Mayor and Council for allowing me to attend the League of Cities this year. Uh, we got to represent the city of Peoria by holding uh, the Peoria flag. I was also with uh, youth liaison uh, Leah and two other youth advisory board members. Uh, it was really an honor to be there and meet other youth councils. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Patena. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> On Thursday, August 23rd, I got to attend the League of Arizona Cities and Towns. Uh, it was held at the Phoenician. Uh, they always have good seminars at, at this event. And more importantly, uh, it's a good opportunity for us to meet with our colleagues uh, from other cities. On Saturday, August 25th, uh, we honored a decade of water safety, and in attendance was Michael Phelps. Um, for those of you who may not know, he's the most highly decorated Olympian in the world. He was a really a very humble man, and he certainly is dedicated uh, to water safety, not only for children, but for adults as well. It was, it was a nice event, and he spent time in the water with uh, some special needs kids as well. Um, Thursday, August 30th, I had a ribbon cutting at the uh, New River Trailhead at Westbrook Village. Um, for those of you who may remember that area, it was an old field that had weeds and debris and an old single family ranch house that uh, housed a chronic audio. Uh, it burned down partially. Then there were several homeless people that used the squad in that house. And then the city took it over. Uh, they put a sidewalk in, they put uh, landscaping in, and then finally uh, we added a ramada, water fountain, bike racks, and ample parking. Uh, it certainly made a difference in, in that area. The people of Westbrook Village and the surrounding area are very pleased that this is uh, another amenity for them and for the city of Peoria. Uh, let's see, congratulations to Chief Miller. Um, I know that this council, the mayor and council, expect good things from you, and we're sure that you will be very successful in your endeavors. And uh, congratulations to you as well, Laura, uh, on a platinum award. It seems like we can't go a council meeting without getting an award for something. So congratulations to you, and it's always great for the city to receive an award. And it also shows that we're concerned 
about the uh, health of its employees, which is a real plus for our city. And also, congratulations to Rick Buss. Happy to have you on board. I think you'll find it is a great city to work for, and we're happy to have you. That's all I have, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Binsbacher. Thank you, Mayor. Um, well, it has been a very busy time in the Mesquite District, um, and I want to thank staff, all of staff, um, and public safety. Uh, serving citizens is a round-the-clock uh, commitment, and it just never stops, and you all are working hard um, throughout the city, but recently in my district with community engagement and getting creative and seeing things through new lenses, and I just really appreciate that. Um, I want to congratulate Chief Miller. Uh, welcome, I would say welcome to Peoria, but you already know Peoria. <laughs> um, we are thrilled to have you, and I look forward to working with you. The support here this evening is a testament to um, a fantastic career that you've already had, and I just look forward to working with you and what's to come. Um, welcome to the adventure, because there's a lot happening in Peoria right now. Uh, same to Rick Buss. Congratulations to you. Uh, we're so lucky to have you uh, and all of your experience and everything that you bring to our city. Again, it's a very, very exciting time. I look forward to working with you and all that's going to happen in the future. Um, Laura, congratulations. I, I, to, not just to Laura, but to all of our city leadership um, and staff in general, all around. A city that commits is so committed to health and wellness like we are really does create uh, the workplace of choice that we are. And to say that we've been one of three cities, did you say, um, receiving this recognition, it speaks volumes to our commitment to our employees, and it makes me very proud. So congratulations. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor Finn. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'd like to reiterate uh, Council Member Binsbacher's comments to Chief and to Rick. Welcome to the family. Um, I believe you are going to find that this is one of the most amazing places um, that you've ever probably worked at. So um, I was actually incredibly impressed with your support, Chief Miller. You had people from out of state here. I mean, you had everybody here, standing ovation from the team. Uh, that was fantastic. So obviously, you're very well respected. We are very lucky to have you here, and we wish you all of the best. So get, get used to sitting in there listening to all the awards that Peoria gets to, by the way. That, uh, we just sit back here and watch you guys do what you do. So thank you. That's all I have. Council Member Edwards. Thank you, Mayor. Well, it goes without saying, welcome aboard, Chief. Welcome aboard, Rick. You guys are part of a great new family, and we look forward to working with you for many, many years to come. So congratulations. Um, I also want to have a shout out to um, Jeff, to your team, because um, one of the items on the consent agenda this evening had to do with um, SLIDs. And so I want to thank you and your staff for, for catching this. And what a SLID is, is a streetlight improvement uh, district. And your staff was able to identify a, an error in two SLIDs that have been happening for quite some time. And so um, found it quite by accident, but jumped in and recognized the error and is working with um, those residents to, to refund some money that is owed to them uh, by no fault of anybody's. But I just want to thank you and your staff for taking the due, due diligence to, to recognize that and, and rectifying that issue. It says a lot for your staff, so thank you so much. Um, I attended the league conference this week and just numerous, um, numerous meetings that we attended from economic development to you know opiate addictions to the economic development of the 21st century, short-term rentals, and the TPT digital good issues, which the mayor uh, was the host of. And these were just some great topics, just some of the many few that I look forward to working with staff and sh showing them what we have learned um, through the league. And maybe some of these things will come to fruition here in, in the city of Peoria. Um, I attended the Michael Phelps uh, swimming event. and. Um, what I thought was astounding is the fact that um, he, his foundation is doing some phenomenal things, but rightfully so, the city of Peoria is doing some phenomenal things. This year alone, the city has provided over 9,000 swim lessons to residents here at Peoria. That's a phenomenal accomplishment. So staff, thank you so much for, for doing that. Um, and then the next day, I attended the um, Senator McCain's viewing at the, at the Capitol, and it was a, a somber experience, and uh, he will be greatly missed with, within the state of Arizona. And then um, I attended the ribbon cutting with Councilman Patena and 
Um, you didn't do it justice. You had a lot of people there. There was a lot of people from, from your community there. And they, you didn't mention the little plaque that you got, uh, the, handmade, the handmade plaque. So he, uh, John Sefton uh, had a, a plaque made of, I believe, and I may be doing it justice, but you had a rendering on a napkin several years ago of what you wanted the trailhead sign to look like. And so John Sefton had taken that napkin and recreated it on a piece of wood and presented that to you at the, uh, at the event. So that was... Yeah. <laughs> um, so it was, it was great to see the turnout of the residents of your community. I, it's just a great addition to our trail system here in Peoria, just one of many uh, more to continue. So I thank you so much for taking the dedication and making that extension of our trail system. And I want to take a shout out to the uh, Ask Me group as well. I want to thank you guys for having your uh, Employee Appreciation uh, Day over at Wet n Wild this weekend, uh, though I wasn't able to attend because I had prior commitments, but my understanding is you had over 355 employees and their families in attendance, and that's a great turnout, and so thank you so much for putting that, on, putting that event on for uh, the city staff. So thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council Member Hunt. Well, I know you two are tired of being welcomed, right? <laughs> but I'm gonna say it anyway. Welcome, Chief, and welcome, um, Rick, <laughs> it's getting late for me. Um, you have landed in an amazing city, and if you don't already know it, uh, you will very soon, and we're very fortunate to have you. Um, you guys mentioned the uh, League of Cities. Uh, our mayor made us proud by leading one of the sessions what was the name of it? It was Council Manager Form of Government. Our Council Management Form of Government. We're very fortunate to have that form of government rather than the strong mayor form that Eastern cities have. Um, and also I wanted to congratulate, ask me what better way to celebrate Labor Day than by having your labor force go out to a water park with their kids and families and uh, just celebrate and have a whooping good time out there. And what a better place in this heat than to be at a water park. Um, I just wanted to reiterate, for those of you that might be listening at home, please get library cards, get your kids' library cards. And even if your kids are tiny, if they're preschoolers, they can still get a library card and let them hold that in their hand and take them to the library. You'll be establishing habits that they will use the rest of their lives in all areas of their life. Help them become readers. It's probably the most important thing you can do for your children when they're little. And I wanna thank both of our public libraries as well as our school libraries. Don't forget the, the school libraries. Uh, they're manned by parapros now. And those women, the ones that I know and that I work with, just do a yeoman's job in creating programs to make kids fall in love with reading. And our friends of the library, they are some of the best friends that Peoria has. Uh, they cannot be beat. So thank you all for being with us this evening, and that's all I have. Thank you. Council Member Leone? <clears throat> yes, thank you. Just, just want to mention that uh, I was with the, the League of Cities with the kids, and a lot of grown-ups, all, all the cities are there, about 80 of them. And it's just great to watch our kids carry the flag down and be proud of Peoria. That's one thing that we do every year, and this is for the kids to work with that flag, and we don't need, uh, we, we don't need a city council person to work with them because they know their way around. I just also want to mention that I went to a firefighter's charity, and it was just great. My wife bought a T-shirt that makes about 10 T-shirts she got. And I told her she should have waited. I could have got it for nothing. But uh, it was a pink pancakes, and that's all I will say for the pink pancakes. Thank you. God bless each and every one of you. God bless America, and God bless our first response. Thank you. Youth Council Liaison Gilbertson. Thank you, Mayor. I'd also like to welcome Chief Miller. Um, and thank you to the council for allowing me to attend the League of Cities. It was an honor to be able to carry the flag. Um, and yes, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. 
Um, and I have, I have someone that I would like to thank. We had Michael Phelps in this city um, because of Jen Stein. She is our director of communications. And, you know, I mean, he, he could have gone to a lot of cities uh, to talk about his foundation, but he came to the city of Peoria. It was highly televised. It makes us look really great. So thank you for contributing to our, our strong and healthy image. We appreciate it. And with that, we are adjourned. <laughs>